Now a hearing on last month's downing of a U.S. missionary plane over Peru and the future of U.S. aerial anti-drug efforts. Yesterday, a House Government Reform Subcommittee heard testimony from officials with the Drug Enforcement Administration, U.S. Customs Service, and the State Department. Indiana Congressman Mark Souter chairs this three-hour and 20-minute hearing. Subcommittee on Criminal Justice, Drug Policy, and Human Resources is now called to order. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Just a little over a week ago, a terrible tragedy occurred that broke the heart of every American. When, through a preventable mistake, a missionary whose life had been committed to serving others on behalf of God was killed along with her little girl. The innocent pilot was also wounded. God's grace is flowing over her husband and son. Ronnie and Charity Bowers now await to be united in a much happier place. God's promise is that all things work together for those who love the Lord. The entire nation has been able to hear of the tremendous faith and confidence of this family. But from a public policy standpoint, where is the United States government to head? What will the United States anti-drug efforts in South America be after the Peru incident? The errors in this particular case already seem pretty clear. An investigative team is in Peru today, headed by Randy Beers of the State Department, to verify the facts and propose solutions. We are looking forward to a speedy presentation to Congress and the general public of those findings. The shoot-down policy support by the United States government was proposed by President Clinton in 1994. It passed the Democrat-controlled House and the Democrat-controlled Senate in 1994. Though this was a Clinton initiative with a totally controlled Democrat Congress, Republicans generally supported President Clinton's policy as well. This policy was not a partisan policy then, nor should it be now. President Clinton stated that the Peruvian government had adequate checks in place to assure that a tragedy such as this would not occur. In President Clinton's statement to Congress, he included, quote, the use of weapons against any such aircraft in flight by the Peruvian Air Force may be authorized under very strict conditions after all attempts to identify innocent aircraft and to persuade the suspect aircraft to land at a control airfield had been exhausted, end quote. Guidelines also specified requirements on flight plans, multiple radio contacts, visual contact, confirmation of the aircraft's identification and registry, and the firing of warning shots first. Clearly, these guidelines were not followed. Some will try to maintain that it was inevitable that such an accident would occur. I disagree. It is not inevitable that in one flight there would be a mix-up of flight plans, language problems, failure to identify tail numbers, failure to make radio contact, failure to fire warning shots, or at least make them aware of such an effort. On top of that, the plane was headed towards the airfield in Iquitos where, according to guidelines, the force down should have occurred. Furthermore, the plane was not using evasive techniques and was headed away from the Colombian border and thus was not in danger of escaping. Any plan that can allow this many errors has a design flaw. At a bare minimum, not enough double checks and training. After the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska, many actions were taken to avoid another oil spill, such as adding a second pilot, having tug escorts, and having spill teams ready to contain another accident, to name just a few. But around the world, we haven't just given up and said no more oil. We will work to avoid a repeat. But this is certain. This policy will never be reinstalled unless President Bush, Secretary Powell, Congress, and ultimately the American people believe that such a tragedy as this is not likely to be repeated because new safeguards have been added. At today's hearing, we will first hear from Congressman Pete Hookstra of Michigan, who represents the Muskegon, Michigan, the hometown of the Bowers family, and Congressman Kurt Weldon of Pennsylvania, who represents the injured pilot Kevin Donaldson. On the third panel, we will hear from several groups opposed to this policy and one who favors it. The second panel will discuss the larger question. Can the drug war in South America be successful? Did this shoot-down policy have any impact on reducing drugs? What is likely to happen without such a policy in place? What other efforts can be undertaken to reduce the flow of illegal drugs into our hometowns? It is important to note to all the members, those in attendance and those watching, none of the agencies in attendance today were part of the tragic mistake in any way. DEA, Customs, ONDCP, the Department of State, and JADF East were not involved. The CIA was invited to testify today. They chose not to attend. I, as chairman of this subcommittee, in fact, have received repeated requests not to hold today's hearing. 
but I strongly believe that this policy should not just be debated behind closed doors. Information should not just come from selected leaks to favored media outlets. Unfortunately, many people in America are becoming convinced, falsely, that the war on drugs has not worked. Secret hearings, hoping this will blow over, will not help the American people understand the difficulty of fighting illegal drugs. They have been swayed by Hollywood screenwriters more than facts. They have been influenced more by propaganda from a few rich drug legalizers than by the hard work of thousands of dedicated law enforcement officers, anti-drug counselors, teachers, and parents who have rescued the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Many Americans also do not understand the tremendous sacrifices the people of Peru, as well as Colombia, Bolivia, Ecuador, and others have made in trying to solve America's and Europe's drug problem. We need to thank them for their efforts more often. Only through open discussions, to the degree possible, of our actions can we build popular support for these needed programs. A common view, one perhaps some will make today, is that the solution is to drop interdiction and concentrate solely on demand reduction. Obviously, demand reduction is a key component of any anti-drug strategy. No effort can possibly succeed without prevention and treatment programs. The federal government already spends far more on prevention and treatment than interdiction. Local and state governments, of course, spend nothing on interdiction, but millions more on prevention and treatment. But it is still not enough. This week, in the Education Committee, we will be reauthorizing the Safe and Drug-Free Schools Act. For two years, I and others have been working on legislation to make this program more effective. Over the last few years, I have been a lead sponsor on the Drug-Free Workplace Bill, the Drug-Free Communities Act, and an advocate for increased funding for drug courts. I support legislation to expand drug treatment coverage. My legislation to hold students who receive student loans accountable if they get convicted of a drug crime has been in the news lately. One of the charges I constantly hear in South and Central America is that we don't do enough here in America, especially from students who studied on U.S. college campuses. But I've noticed something interesting in the six years I've been in Congress. Many critics of drug interdiction programs also don't seem to be advocates of tough prevention programs either. No drug testing, no losing of any benefits, no clear anti-drug message. After all, marijuana may be medicinal. We're either serious about the war on drugs or we are not. In the past decade, over 200,000 Americans have died from the effects of illegal drugs. 34,000 were killed in, the Vietnam, in Korea and 47,000 in battle in Vietnam. Are we serious about the drug war or not? And what is the alternative of those who oppose the war on drugs? Having more weed-whacked, meth-wasted, heroin-junkie crackheads driving the car headed in your direction, or prowling your neighborhood, or perhaps even more painfully, coming home to beat you or your child? The facts are simple. When this country focuses on the war on drugs, we make progress. The witnesses here today from the various agencies will make that clear. What we lack is a steady commitment. Drugs, like other dirty crimes that good and decent people don't like to think about, like child abuse, spouse abuse, rape, will never be eliminated. Sin will always exist, but we can never just abandon a battered spouse or child. We must do what we can to spare as many as possible the agony and the pain. We may not eliminate our social ills, but with dedication, they can, in fact, be controlled. I now yield to the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Cummings of Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I first want to welcome my colleague and friend, Representative Janice Schakowsky of Illinois to our uh, committee. Um, Mr. Chairman, we are all deeply saddened and concerned by the tragic incident in Peru that claimed the innocent life of Veronica and Charity Bowers and seriously injured pilot Kevin Donaldson. My serious condolences go out to the families and loved ones of the deceased. Our thoughts and prayers go out to John and Corey Bowers who survived the air assault relatively unharmed thanks to the heroic flying and water landing managed by Mr. Donaldson. I think it's safe to say that there's one thing that unites all of the members of this panel, ensuring that what happened on April 21st never happens again. As a ranking member of this subcommittee, it is critical that we ascertain all the facts surrounding this incident. I'm happy that the Bush administration has dispatched an interagency investigative team to Lima, Peru, to learn the truth from the various conflicting claims and reports. I hope that we will soon have an accurate, definitive account of what happened. What seems clear, based upon what we know, is that no one involved desired this tragic result. 
namely the taking of innocent American lives. What also seems clear, though, is that the incident was avoidable. Clearly, the danger to innocent lives was contemplated when Congress and President Clinton decided to go along with the shoot-down policy adopted by Peru in 1994. Obviously, somewhere along the way, procedural safeguards broke down in this case. The Washington Post has characterized as meticulous Peru's adherence to these procedures for intercepting suspect aircraft under the 1995 U.S.-Peru Air Surveillance and Information Sharing Agreement. But the record has not been perfect. In 1997, the Peruvian Air Force deviated from the procedures when it shot down a suspect plane without warning or contact because the lives taken in that incident turned out to be those of South American drug smugglers, the target of the shoot-down policy, there was not the controversy that surrounds the recent incident. Nevertheless, in wake of the 1997 shoot-down, the United States government took steps to ensure that all Peruvian officials involved in the air interdiction program became well-versed in the procedures. Clearly, another refresher course may be in order. But is that all? Mr. Chairman, this incident opens up a range of questions relating to our air interdiction efforts, including the nuts and bolts questions about the cooperation, communication, and accountability between and among the various United States and Peruvian agencies involved. I hope my colleagues in the administration will also take this occasion to consider the broader questions of accountability and due process that are inherent in a program that makes the United States complicit in a policy that permits, indeed promotes, the killing of individuals merely suspected of drug smuggling. Due process is at the heart of the notion of human rights embodied in the American justice system, a system that we hold up as a model to developing democracies and aspiring democratic movements around the globe. The Peruvian shoot-down policy would never be permitted as a domestic United States policy precisely because it goes against one of our most sacred due process principles, namely that all persons are presumed innocent until proven guilty. The same due process ideal informs international law prohibiting the shoot, shooting down of any civilian aircraft not engaged in military attack. Under, United, under the United States endorsed shoot-down policy, civilian pilots and passengers in foreign lands are expect, accepted from that fundamental protection. Guilt or innocence is determined by military pilots who also man the firing line. As the recent incident demonstrates, there's a real danger to all civilian air travelers in areas where the shoot-down policy is in effect. As for accountability, news reports suggest that the 1995 U.S.-Peru agreement was designed to avoid U.S. accountability. The agreement is intentionally silent on the question of whether United States officials have decision-making authority in shoot-down scenarios. Because as one official quoted, was quoted as saying, and I quote, we didn't want to assume responsibility when somebody made a decision to shoot down an airplane, end of quote. According to at least one article, a Defense Department spokesman immediately distanced the department from the controversy. The DOD spokesman vigorously noted that, in this case, the United States surveillance plane was not a Defense Department asset. DOD, Customs Service, and other United States government assets are nevertheless regularly employed in South America Air Interdiction Program. As our colleague and newest subcommittee member, Congresswoman Janice Schakowsky stressed in an April 24th letter to you, Mr. Chairman, the CIA's use of private contract employees, including in this case, further clouds the accountability issue, perhaps by design. All of this begs the important question, just where does the buck stop? Mr. Chairman, few, if any, are more than aware than I am 
of the immense and tragic toll that illicit drugs take on innocent American lives in communities across this nation. Certainly, Veronica and Charity Bowers are not the first innocent victims of the war on drugs. It's a policy that also sacrifices core American values, a prudent and acceptable course to follow. Unfortunately, we will not hear from the CIA today, but I look forward to hearing the testimony of all of our witnesses who will appear before us today. And I thank the chairman for allowing my requests to hear from Pete West of the National Business Aviation Association and Adam Isaacson of the Center for International Policy, who will appear on panel three, and Phil Boyer of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, who has submitted a statement for the record. And I agree with you, Mr. Chairman, we should have hearings in the open so the public can fully understand and fully appreciate what all of us go through and all of our uh, those people fighting this war on drugs go through and sacrifice. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you. Thank you. Mr. Micah. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for holding uh, this open, uh, fair, and uh, probing hearing. I think it's important that uh, uh, this particular issue be aired before the Congress and before uh, uh, this subcommittee with jurisdiction. Um, the innocent death of a, a, a mother and a baby uh, is almost impossible to uh, comprehend. Uh, our hearts, uh, our sympathy go out to the Bowers uh, family. Uh, unfortunately, we're engaged in a, a silent war in which there are uh, tens of thousands, even millions of victims uh, across the United States and across the world. Uh, I think today, uh, as a result of this hearing, it would be horrible to compound uh, one great tragedy and a loss to a family by uh, developing policies that would create an even greater tragedy. It's very difficult to get a handle on uh, the illegal narcotics problem. I've worked with the chairman, current chairman. I served as chairman of this subcommittee. I've worked with Mr. Cummings and others. Uh, and I think we have some well-intended people. Mr. Cummings told you the result of uh, illegal narcotics in his uh, district. They had over 300 people dying per year last year through his intervention. We've got it under 300 uh, for the first time. But uh, just to comprehend the scope of this problem, over 16 thousand Americans lost their lives last year, or in the last recorded year, 99, to drug-related uh, deaths, overdose and other deaths. For the first time in the history of this nation, those deaths exceeded homicides. And then if we include homicides, probably half of the homicides were drug-related. Uh, question is, what do we do? Do we continue this policy of information sharing? I think it was applied uh, by our responsible agencies and individuals in a responsible fashion as we intended the law. Has it had an effect? Yes, it's had an effect. Since 1995, in Peru, cocaine production is down 68% since 1995. In Bolivia, production is down 82%. Uh, uh, I visited Peru, uh, and I, I know uh, others on this panel have too, when it was in turmoil, when there was disruption, uh, when uh, terrorist activities were being financed uh, by drug activities. It's been difficult to bring that under control, but the Peruvians have uh, done their best. I think that we've got to learn by this tragedy. Uh, we've got to find out what uh, went wrong, institute further safeguards, make certain that it doesn't uh, happen uh, again. Uh, what's at fault here, uh, we must remember, are people who are dealing in death and destruction and illegal narcotics, drug dealers. Uh, and uh, that's what we should be targeting, our best way to go after these uh, people. I strongly uh, advocate continuing this information sharing uh, program. I strongly uh, 
support the Peruvians in their anti-narcotics efforts. I also strongly uh, support inclusion of safeguards that make certain that we don't have another tragedy like this, but we also prevent the tragedies that occur to the extent of having three columbines a day in this country uh, with our, our young people. So, Mr. Chairman, again, I thank you, and I hope this can be a productive uh, meeting and result in a, a positive uh, changes. Thank you. And I'll yield to Congresswoman Schakowsky for an open statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm uh, really pleased to be at least considered for, as, for membership on this uh, subcommittee once again. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks and to enter into the record questions for witnesses and other materials. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to do a procedural matter where we uh, allow all written statements, but unless there's objections, so ordered. Thank you. I am pleased that the subcommittee has convened today to hear testimony on the U.S. policy of intelligence sharing and participation in air interdiction operations in South America. I'm sorry that it has taken the loss of two innocent U.S. civilians and possibly others to raise the visibility of this questionable policy. In March, when the subcommittee heard testimony on U.S. policy toward Colombia, I raised several questions and concerns about the use of private contractors by the United States in the Andean region. I said, the privatization of our military and police assistance raises important oversight questions as we get drawn deeper into Colombia's civil war. The most obvious question is, why do we need to outsource and privatize our efforts? The American taxpayers already pay $300 billion per year to fund the world's most powerful military. Why should they have to pay a second time in order to privatize our operations? Are we outsourcing in order to avoid public scrutiny, controversy, or embarrassment? Is it to hide body bags from the media and thus shield them from public opinion? Or is it to provide deniability because these private contractors are not covered by the same rules as active duty U.S. persons? How, about, how is the public to know what their tax dollars are being used for? Is there a potential for a privatized Gulf of Tonkin incident? Then the American people deserve to have a full and open de debate before this policy goes any further. That is what I said in March. Since then, I have introduced H.R. 1591, legislation that would prohibit U.S. funds from being used to contract with private military companies in the Andean region. The U.S. taxpayers are unwittingly funding a private war with private soldiers. This is a shoot first and ask questions later policy encouraged by the United States in its war on drugs. Shooting down unarmed civilian aircraft, even those thought to be carrying drugs, is contrary to fundamental U.S. law enforcement policy. I don't think that any of my colleagues would support U.S. law enforcement officials in this country shooting down planes or blowing up vans based simply on the suspicion or even the conviction that drugs are present. We believe in due process, which should be no less respected in other countries than it is in our own. The kind of action we saw in Peru last week amounts to an extrajudicial killing, and we in this country now have innocent blood on our hands because of it. Those are the facts, and they were proven on April 20th, the day the actions of the CIA contractors resulted in the death of Veronica and Charity Bowers. This is what the American public is reading about in this, about this failed policy. In the Miami Herald, it said, Peru's Air Force, with U.S. assistance, committed an unforgivable error in the wake of last week's shooting, the Bush administration should reconsider the merits of the interdiction effort. In the Chicago Tribune, where I'm from, given U.S.-led counter-narcotic strategies in the region since 1994, this tragedy was bound to happen. Where the, wherever the culpability lies in this instance, the larger issue is whether the U.S. strategy to use military interdiction in Peru, Colombia, and other Andean nations, while demand for cocaine still flourishes in America, amounts to a fool's errand. The Peru incident should set off alarms in the Bush administration about what could happen in Colombia as the U.S. becomes more involved. This is an opportunity to rethink the whole strategy. And the Atlanta Journal-Constitution said in their headline, deaths in Peru symbolize danger, futility of drug war. The Bush administration acted quickly, it says, to freeze anti-drug surveillance flights in Peru. But President Bush should have taken the opportunity to ask for a broad review of the long-time Washington policy of assisting drug interdiction in foreign countries. Can anyone point to data that shows that shooting down planes over Peru has done anything to stop even one addict in this country from using drugs? This is a war we cannot win. And finally, the Chicago Sun-Times said, um, 
Their headline was, only losers in the war that we can't win, unquote. Uh, the, they say, the Bowers are just one example of how the U.S. war on drugs, as virtuous as its intent may be, has had consequences serious enough to call into question our ineffective approach to America's appetite for illegal substances, unquote. We are here today to reevaluate our policy, to try to pick up the pieces and move on. I know some of those with us today would like to put this tragedy behind us and get back to the business of the drug war. However, there are so many questionable aspects of our policy and so many unanswered questions. Why do we have to hire private contractors to do our work in Andean countries? How much of the public's money has been spent to hire what some have referred to as mercenaries? Where is the accountability? Who exactly are they? Do they even speak Spanish? From what, I, from what I do know, outsourcing in the Andean region is a way to avoid congressional oversight and public scrutiny. The use of private military contractors risks drawing the U.S. into regional conflicts and civil war. It is clear to me that this practice must stop. I realize that there are those who are willing to risk the incident, an risk another incident like this, but I am not. We have spent billions of taxpayer dollars, employed personnel from numerous agencies and around the world, and the drugs continue to flow into the United States. Are the Bowers acceptable collateral, collateral damage in this war on drugs? We need a new approach. I agree with Secretary Don Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld, when he said, I am one who believes that the drug problem is probably overwhelmingly a demand problem, and it's going to find, if the demand persists, it's going to find ways to get what it wants. And if it isn't from Colombia, it will be from somebody else. The administration should rethink its budget request for the Andean region, but immediately we should go beyond the suspension of surveillance flights in Peru and suspend all U.S. contracts with private military firms in the Andean region. The audio and videotapes and other materials related to this and other shootdowns in the Andean region should also be shared with the Congress and the public. And finally, the Bush administration's proposed nomination of John Walters as the next drug czar raises troubling implications for the future of this tragic policy. An outspoken advocate of the shoot-down policy, he has even been criticized by General Barry McCaffrey on Meet the Press for being too focused on interdiction. That was a quote. I want to thank and welcome our distinguished witnesses for being here today and look forward to their testimony. Congresswoman Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to say thank you for calling this hearing and I thank the panelists and witnesses for coming. And I do have a written statement I'd like uh, entered into the record. Thank the gentlelady. Uh, uh, Congressman Osi was here earlier. Uh, he has been down with us to uh, uh, South and Central America. And we'll have a number of members coming in and out today as we're coming back into session uh, later this afternoon. Before proceeding, I would like to take care of some procedural matters. First, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to submit written statements and questions for the hearing record, that any answers to written questions provided by the witnesses also be included in the record. Without objection, it is so ordered. Second, I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Platts, and the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, who are both members of the full committee, be permitted to participate in the hearing and to question witnesses under the five-minute rule in each round after all the members of the subcommittee have completed their questioning. Uh, as you heard, uh, Ms. Schakowsky is being added to the committee, but it hasn't been uh, cleared through, uh, but uh, it will be in our next full meeting. Without objection, it is so ordered. We will now begin with our first panel, which is made up of Two members of Congress, both longtime friends of mine whose constituents were involved in the incident in Peru. Uh, we welcome both of you. Uh, it is standard practice of, a, of an oversight committee to do a swearing in. We do not do it for members of Congress because when we take the oath of office, uh, that is the same uh, as we do uh, for witnesses here. So, Congressman Hoekstra, you are now recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for inviting me to testify this afternoon. As many of you now realize, the Bowers family was from Muskegon, Michigan, in my congressional district. Over the past several days, I've been deeply involved in this matter. I appreciate this opportunity to speak publicly about the impact of the downing of that missionary plane in Peru. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank my colleague, Kurt Weldon, uh, for working for, in a partnership uh, over the last 10 days in dealing with a, a whole range of issues that uh, I don't think either one of us have ever dealt with before uh, and hope that we never have to deal with again. 
The events of April 20 once again show that the policies we implement and or support as a, con as a Congress have real consequences. For the Bowers family, Jim, Ronnie, and their children, Corey and Charity, those consequences have forever changed their lives. The same is true for the seriously injured pilot, Kevin Donaldson, and his family. The events of that day are well known to all of you. As your subcommittee and others take a closer look at the tragedy in Peru that took the lives of two innocent people, I would ask you to remember what the real cost of this event has been. A young woman, Ronnie Bowers, a daughter, a wife, a mother, a friend, and a woman dedicated to sharing her faith with the people of Peru, along with her young adopted daughter, Charity, was killed senselessly and needlessly. There was no reason, there was no purpose, there was no gain. There is only the devastation laid on the doorstep of a family whose life was devoted to sharing the message of God, a message that has been amplified and one that has helped sustain them during these last horrible days. I'll mention more about that in just a moment. As you look at the actual events, the policy that led up to those events and the reasons the policy contributed to these deaths, please do not forget that we are talking about real people. Ronnie and Charity had a profound effect on the lives that they touched. They were missionaries living a lifestyle of sacrifice so that they might be able to minister to the people in that region. I would like to thank the many agencies, both in the United States and in Peru, which in the hours and the days after this tragedy worked to help the victims and assist my office in separating fact from rumor. Their help ensured that I was equipped to help the Bowers family in the most effective way possible. I acknowledge the State Department, particularly our Consul General Office in Lima, the Central Intelligence Agency, with special thanks to Director Tenet, the Drug Enforcement Agency, and the Peruvian government for their efforts to expedite the return of both the survivors and those killed on, they, on that fateful morning. The private sector, including Northwest Airlines and Continental, Continental Airlines, also stepped up to the plate to make sure this difficult time was made more manageable. When a family is visited by such enormous grief, there's almost always understandable outrage. But while the Bowers family has been deeply and permanently hurt, their attitude has not been accusatory, but rather conciliatory. When many of us would have withdrawn from the fresh and painful memory of this horrible incident, the, De the Bowers talked about the all too short but miraculous lives of their beloved Ronnie and Charity and expressed their steadfast belief that this incident was part of a larger plan. The awesome power of God has been demonstrated through this event in ways no man could devise. Over the last few months, Ronnie had been praying the prayer of Jabez. This prayer calls for God to expand the territories that someone might influence for the Lord. Over the last 10 days, the ministry of the Bowers and the Donaldsons has been seen and experienced by millions of people throughout the United States and around the world. Seeing the family and their friends and co-workers handle this tragedy has been truly inspiring. They have demonstrated a quiet, yet strong confidence that they gained through their knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that these families knew Jesus and that Jesus has helped them through these difficult days as he supported them in their earlier ministry. Now it is up to us to make sure this never happens again. As a government, I hope we make public all the relevant information regarding this event. The families and the American people deserve to know how this happened. I know there are certain pieces of this complex puzzle that we will never be able to explain, but there should be no part that we keep hidden. As we make this information public, I want it released in such a way that is considerate to the families and victims. The families must be given the choice of reviewing such information before they see it on the evening news. We must also review the history of this program. I've learned that there have been concerns about certain actions, actions of the Peruvian Air Force in the past. The kind of concerns that could have been a red flag warning that tragedies such as this could occur. 
We need to review those in more detail. But the question is clear. Did the U.S. have any indication or warning that a tragic mistake like this could happen? As we consider the lives lost and forever altered by this event, we must consider the policy that led to the involvement of the United States. As a Congress, we must weigh our desire to stop the flow of drugs into this country against the need to keep innocent people, no matter what their country of origin, safe. We must carefully consider whether we should continue to embrace a policy that can and has resulted in unnecessary, unwarranted, and totally unacceptable loss of life. And finally, we must reflect on whether we, through our actions here today and elsewhere, can ensure that this never happens again. We owe that to Ronnie and Charity. We owe it to Jim and Corey. We owe it to Kevin Donaldson and his family, friends, and co-workers. I'd also like to submit, for the record, two newspaper articles that I think are very pertinent. The first is from this morning's Washington Post that does a fine job of showing the power of the Bower's faith in ministry called Divine Intervention. The second is an editorial in Sunday's Grand Rapids Press by John Douglas entitled The Real Killers in Peru, U.S. Drug Users. I hope you'll have time to read both of them. Mr. Chairman, thank you for inviting me to testify today. Without objection, uh, both articles will be inserted in the record. Uh, Congressman Weldon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me begin by thanking you and the distinguished ranking member and the other members of the subcommittee for responding so quickly to the letter that uh, our colleague and I sent to you the day after this incident occurred asking for congressional inquiry into this outrageous and brutal murder of two American citizens in Peru. The Peruvian government needs to be held accountable for this action, and so does the American government and its agencies. Let me start out by saying I'm a supporter of our drug policy in South America. I've traveled there this year and I'm planning a second trip uh, to spend time uh, understanding the role of Plan Colombia and its activities and relationships on neighboring countries, including Peru. I'm also a strong supporter of the military. I've been on the Armed Services Committee for eight terms. I chair the Readiness Subcommittee, which oversees $110 billion of defense spending. And I will let you be assured that our committee is equally concerned about this incident and what we can do to get to the bottom of it. But I think your committee is in a unique position because you can come in as an outsider and look at both the intelligence, both the intelligence committee activities and actions and our Department of Defense actions. We are asking the Department of Defense and have received classified briefings. And that's why my comments today will be based on public records so that I don't, in fact, cross that line. But I think there are questions that this committee, in particular, can get to the bottom of through your subpoena power and through a necessary action to understand what really occurred and the involvement of both the Peruvian Air Force and our military. I'm going to make my comments rather short because I did have a constituent family involved, but I think my <laughs> colleagues expressed the condolences that both of us shared with that family and with their loved ones during the days following that incident. I want to focus on some basic questions that you need to get answered. These need to be answered publicly because the factors around these questions have been raised publicly. But up until now, we've seen the agencies him and haul and not want to go into depth about the answer to these questions, which I think lie at the bottom of the investigation that your committee is about to undertake. I would encourage you to use your subpoena power because no agency of the federal government, including the CIA or Defense Intelligence, is above the oversight of this Congress. And we have an obligation to make sure that they're abiding by our laws and our regulations. In fact, our defense authorization bill several years ago dealt with the policies that are in play in this particular incident. So let me proceed with the questions which I would ask your committee to raise and to get answers to during this hearing and follow on investigative work with the various agencies of our government. First of all, why was this plane brutally fired upon before it was identified or asked to descend? A common understanding would be if you see a plane in an area, you would first of all ask to identify that plane and certainly instruct it to descend. There are mixed signals in the public arena 
about whether or not these directions were given or whether or not these questions were asked. We need to know the factual answer to that question. Number two, State Department spokesman Richard Boucher acknowledged after the incident, and I quote, there are certainly indications that our folks on the plane were trying to hold the Peruvians back from taking action in this case, end quote. Well, this committee needs to find out what were those indications. Mr. Boucher wasn't to the point. He didn't give us the detailed information that now can be known from the tape recordings that were on that plane. We need to know what those indications were that Mr. Boucher was referring to that indicate that our folks on the plane were trying to hold the Peruvians back on this incident. I have my doubts until the very end of the actions by our own people. Number three, there is referral in the media that the plane was flying straight and level, which would indicate there was no effort to evade the uh, Peruvian military. The videotape, which is available to this committee, either through subpoena or through voluntary compliance, shows that the Peruvians omitted or, quote, truncated various parts of the procedure that are designed to avoid the downing of a civilian aircraft. This quote was made by a U.S. official who reviewed the videotape but did not want his name used. I would ask this committee to find that individual or to review that videotape itself and allow the committee to make a determination about the truncation of the various parts of a procedure which our government and the Peruvian government had agreed upon prior to this action in terms of these kinds of planes. Number four, were strict procedures followed? The previous question said there was an allusion by an American official to a truncation of the process. Well, let's review what the strict procedures are that were established by our government and the Peruvian government when a suspect plane could be shot down. U.S. monitors patrolling the border zone first had to establish reasonable suspicion that the aircraft is primarily engaged in illicit drug trafficking, according to our National Defense Authorization Act of 1995. That is a bill that my committee prepared, and all of us support it with overwhelming numbers. That was the criteria in our legislation. Flying without a flight plan in a high-traffic drug zone is considered grounds for reasonable suspicion. Once U.S. officials tip the Peruvian military about a suspicious airplane, the Peruvians must try to identify the plane by its markings, make radio contact, and order it to land for inspection. If radio contact is not possible, the Peruvian pilot making the intercept must make visual contact with the suspect aircraft and direct it to land at a secure airfield. If the orders are ignored, the Peruvian attack plane must get permission from superiors to fire warning shots at the suspicious aircraft first. If the warning shots are ignored, the military plane may shoot to disable the aircraft only if all of that fails. May the pilot shoot down the aircraft. Mr. Chairman, there are the procedures that our government and the Peruvian government agreed upon. I am convinced they were totally violated in this action. And two people were brutally massacred because of the violations of that established and agreed upon procedure. We need to have this committee get to the bottom of why the procedure was not fully followed. Number five is also an important point that has to be raised. And it's someone, somewhat of a difficult point with a pilot who happens to be from my district. Was there a flight plan filed? Mr. Chairman, there are reports by the organization that sponsored this plane, the Aviation Director for the Association of Baptists for World Evangelism, Hank Shetelma, that his group's plane had contacted the Iquitos Airport 45 minutes after it took off, or about 15 to 20 minutes before the attack. Now, Mario Justo, the Civil Aviation Chief at that airport, said the tower received no communication from the plane until moments before it was downed. Mr. Chairman, obviously, someone is not being factually correct. We need to know if that plane filed a flight plan, and if it did, and if it was filed 45 minutes before it was to land, then that airport knew that that plane was en route and also was tracking the uh, CIA-operated plane as well. Number six. 
Why was there not more aggressive and decisive action taken by the American crew on board that chaser plane? Why did that crew not more decisively attempt to abort the mission if they suspected the target aircraft was not involved in drug trafficking? Mr. Chairman, I submit to you, and I'm using all unclassified material, there is significant classified material for you to make that determination. You can request and should demand those tapes. You should review them because this committee needs to make a fair and independent assessment as to whether or not our, our employees on that plane took clear and decisive action. I will let this committee make that judgment in its wisdom after reviewing those materials. And finally, was the Iquitos airport contacted in advance? A question that you need to ask and get specific response from the Peruvian government. Mr. Chairman, these questions are very difficult for all of us, but the fact is that two Americans are dead today because, in my opinion, not just the Peruvian government, but our government failed two of our citizens. This should not have taken place. This is not about whether or not the drug war needs to be continually fought. It does. And in fact, I agree with the comments made by our colleagues that much of the battle needs to be fought in the states. We need to stop glorifying the use of drugs, as we hear every night on the TV set and our, and our media, and start to go after those people who caused the problem in the first place, which is the demand, which causes farmers in Colombia and Peru and Ecuador to sell drugs because of the huge profits that are being made by those in America who want to use those very drugs. One final point, and this follows up on the comments of Ms. Schakowsky, and that's relative to the use of civilian contractors. I'm not going to go as far as my colleague has gone, and I respect her um, tremendously for her leadership in this area, in saying we should never use contractors, because there are times, I think, where that case may be able to be made. But I can tell you this committee needs to look at the contractors that our intelligence community utilizes. Why do I say that? Not just because of this incident. A decade ago, I lost a nephew, a young nephew who was sucked out of the Air Force by a recruiter for a CIA contractor, promising him lucrative dollars to fly missions into Angola. None of us in the family knew that my nephew, Robbie, was flying on a former CIA contractor in Angola. He was shot down and killed. The plane was demolished. To this day, I've never been satisfied with the response that I got from our intelligence community about whether or not that contractor was still involved with missions of intelligence and whether or not my nephew was killed in vain. Mr. Chairman, we owe it to all Americans to let them know that their government is monitoring our agencies. No agency of this government is above the law. I applaud you for your leadership. I applaud my colleagues for their interest. And I look forward to working with you as a senior member of the Armed Services Committee to get the answers we all need. I thank both gentlemen for their uh, statements. And let me, for the record, uh, first acknowledge uh, that Congresswoman Schakowsky has, in fact, asked uh, us to look at the contractor question. We are uh, looking at the best way to approach that, and, and uh, we will not be cowed. Uh, I appreciate that the Congressman from Michigan is on the Intelligence Committee. The Congressman from Pennsylvania has been a longtime leader in, in these issues and in intelligence. And just so we, I can reiterate the point, this is a bipartisan concern. The original legislation, ironically, was introduced by uh, then Congressman Schumer and Congressman Sensenbrenner to do this bill. Then the House bill was uh, a similar variation on, on the Peru question was introduced by Mr. Torricelli and Mr. Lantos and Mr. McCandless. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Weldon, you were on the committee and supported this effort. But all of us, in a bipartisan way, want to make sure that it's being implemented the way that Congress passed it. There is no way that Congressman Lantos or uh, Senator Schumer uh, and the others would, would support what happened here either. Uh, nobody is above the law. I, uh, Chairman Burton and I discussed over the last few days the possibility of a subpoena on this hearing uh, for the CIA. At this point, we decided not to issue a subpoena for today's hearing. There is a... Uh, a um, uh, investigation going on right now in Peru. Uh, as I said in my opening statement, we want to make sure that is released. I uh, am uh, more than willing to let other committees, including the Intelligence Committee, go ahead. I understand there are many uh, uh, other operations that have, have to be worked through. But the American public has a right to know 
uh, what we are doing uh, <coughs> regarding uh, learning the facts about this. The, uh, as Congressman Hoekstra said, he didn't want to see the, the audio and, and video tapes released before the families could see them, which is a very reasonable request. But at some point here, once we see quotes and comments in the media by apparently a few selected members of the media being able to see this, yet we do not know whether we have seen the whole tape or heard the audio tape. Once you have partial release, this is now in public domain. And the, the, it is endangering all drug efforts because people assume this kind of stuff goes on all the time. Uh, and, and there has to be uh, some sunshine on this because uh, I want to point out again, this is a, a bipartisan concern for many times different reasons, but a general concern uh, about what has uh, uh, happened here and how if this policy is ever reinstituted in other policies, whether it's contracting out or the clearances and how not to have, because we can't make these kind of decisions, but what kind of checks can we have and balances that are even more tight when we deal with other nations, not just in the air surveillance, but as we're going to hear in, in many different areas. I'd also like to, to now yield to uh, Congressman uh, Platts of Pennsylvania, who represents the district where the association is based for our opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I uh, have submitted a copy of my opening statement for uh, inclusion in the written record and, and won't share uh, all of the aspects of that, and, and many of it dovetails with uh, our panel um, participants. And uh, we we'll just thank you for the scrutiny you are bringing to this issue. Um, the Association of Baptists for World Evangelism is located in York County, Pennsylvania, in my congressional district. And you know, we certainly as a nation need to do our utmost to uh, take a, a tremendous personal tragedy of the Bowers family and turn it into a public good to ensure that no future citizen is an innocent victim. Of, uh, of their life being taken, and in this case, uh, a mother and wife, a uh, you know a sister, a daughter uh, to uh, to Ronald Bowers, that we don't allow this to occur. And uh, I think your uh, efforts uh, as chairman of the committee will play a in very important role in ensuring that we guard against this occurrence in the future. But I um, I think there are a lot of unanswered questions, and and. Mr. Weldon, Mr. Hoekstra have raised some very important issues that uh, you are pursuing, and, and any way that I can assist uh, as a member of the full Government Reform Committee, I look forward to doing so. But we need to get to the bottom of this and um, not allow this tragedy to go uh, uh, unlearned from uh, for the future. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Hookster or Weldon, did you have any additional comments? Thank you. Thank you very much for coming today. We'll move ahead now to our uh, second panel. Sure. If uh, you could all come forward. Our second panel consists of representatives of the federal agencies who are most directly involved in our interdiction efforts on a day-to-day -day basis. I want to personally thank all of you for appearing today on very short notice on this critical issue. Again, I would like to note that the subcommittee invited CI Director Tenet or representative of the Central Intelligence Agency and that the agency did not respond to our request. With us today from the Office of National Drug Control Policy is Bob Brown, the Acting Deputy Director for Supply Reduction, who will give us an overview of the background of the overall interdiction program. From the Drug Enforcement Administration, Administrator Donnie Marshall. From the U.S. Customs Service, Acting Commissioner Chuck Winwood. And from the State Department, we have John Crow, the Director of Latin American and Caribbean Programs from the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs. Finally, to give us an operational and big picture perspective, we have Rear Admiral David Belts, Director of the Joint Interagency Task Force East. As an oversight committee, I'm going to have you all stand up again. Uh, it is our standard practice to ask our witnesses to testify under oath. Will the witnesses stand? Raise your right hand, and I will administer the oath. Do you swear that the testimony you will give us today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that the witnesses have all answered in the affirmative. We will now, ask the, uh, we will now recognize the witnesses for their opening statements. We we'll ask you to summarize your testimony in five minutes and include any fuller statements you may wish to make in the record. Mr. Brown, do you have an opening statement? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, I do. Chairman Souter, Mr. Cummings. Committee members, thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee. We at ONDCP appreciate your involvement 
an oversight of all aspects of our drug policy. <clears throat> At the outset, let me also express condolences to the family and friends of the Bowers for their tragic loss. We also very much re regret the injury suffered by Mr. Donaldson, the pilot, and wish him a full and speedy recovery. Also, with regard to this incident, I would underscore that a joint Peruvian and American fact-finding effort began yesterday in Peru to determine the causes of this terrible accident. All U.S. government activities which directly uh, support the air interdiction programs in Peru and Colombia were immediately suspended after the incident on Friday, April 20th, pending a thorough investigation and review. While it would be inappropriate for me to discuss the particular details of this tragedy, given the ongoing investigation, I think it would be useful to summarize how our air interdiction program fits into our overall international drug control strategy. Cocaine remains the nation's principal drug concern, with more than 3 million chronic addicts spending more than $37 billion per year, uh, per year at the retail level. Although the number of monthly cocaine consumers is down 70 percent from its peak in 1985, cocaine still wreaks devastation on families and communities across our nation. Because cocaine is the most damaging <coughs> drug, it is therefore our first priority for supply reduction efforts. If I can direct your attention to uh, chart number one, and I, I believe there are copies of these charts uh, provided to the committee members. Here in chart number one, we see that cocaine is produced entirely within the Andean region, that is, Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia. As you see in the inset bar graph and referred to earlier, uh, the overall cocaine production potential has dropped 68 percent in Peru and 82 percent in Bolivia between the years 1995 and 2000. Even considering the expansion of coca production in Colombia during this period, there has been an overall reduction of 17 percent in cocaine production capacity or potential in the Andean region. Turning to the second chart regarding air interdiction in Peru, here you see how traffickers reacted to enhanced U.S. supported air interdiction beginning in 1995. On the left of the chart in the early part of the 90s, coca-based flights in that day, at that time Peru was the dominant uh, coca producer in the Andean countries, these coca-based flights flew directly north to finishing labs in Colombia. After interdiction became more effective and pilots, criminal pilots, if you will, were convinced of the risk of flying, drug traffic flights became extraordinarily expensive to the traffickers and diverted further and further into the east, as noted there on the chart. And finally, with the third uh, chart, here you see how successful air interdiction affected the price of Peruvian growers that they could get for coca in Peru and how that caused coca production to fall over time. In 1994, U.S. assistance was suspended, and by the beginning of 95, prices reached record levels. In March of 95, as referred to earlier in our first panel and earlier commentary, U.S. assistance resumed, and the impact was immediate. Pilots wouldn't fly into central Peru to pick up a load of drugs. Coca farmers couldn't sell the crop and began abandoning their fields. Over the last three years, prices have recovered, but for a greatly reduced volume of coca. Again, approximately one quarter of what it was uh, at the early part of this, this period. Let me make two final <coughs> points. We must continue to support the Andean region if we are to reduce the supply of illegal drugs in a meaningful way. The Andes are at the core of the U.S. drug supply threat. This is why the administration has launched a comprehensive Andean regional initiative with assistance not just for Colombia, but for all the nations of the Andean region. As this committee well knows, drug trafficking, drug abuse continue to exact a considerable toll on our country. We estimate that the United States suffers more than 50,000 drug-related deaths annually. Drug abuse costs our nation about $110 billion a year from <coughs> disease, lost productivity, and crime. Our national drug strategy supports effective international cooperation, law enforcement, and demand reduction programs. That multifaceted approach over time has reduced the impact of drugs on the United States. 
Finally, I would reiterate our condolences to the Bowers family regarding this terrible tragedy and, of course, would be happy to respond to any questions that the committee wishes to offer. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Marshall, do you have an opening statement? Yes, I do. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Cummings and the other distinguished members of the subcommittee. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss what I think is a very important and timely uh, topic of our air interdictions in South America. The loss of lives and the injuries that we saw in the April 20th incident in Peru is indeed very, very tragic, and I want to join all of you in honoring the memories of those that perished. I also extend my deepest condolences to the families and the friends of those that lost their lives, and I have remembered all of them in my prayers as well. I know that they are indeed struggling through some very difficult times in the aftermath of this incident. And finally, sir, on behalf of uh, everyone in DEA, I want to thank this entire committee uh, for your support of our agency and for all of uh, drug law enforcement. We're present, DEA is present, in over 300 U.S. cities and 52 foreign countries. We have general aviation aircraft assigned to several of our overseas offices. In Peru, for example, there are two civilian-type turboprop aircraft. The pilots of those aircraft are DEA special agents, and the aircraft bear U.S. registration numbers. They operate there with the full knowledge of the U.S. Embassy and host country officials, and our DEA pilots follow host nation aviation regulations. The DEA aircraft that we have assigned in Peru do not participate directly in air interdiction operations. Rather, their missions normally include the transportation of special agents, host country police, prosecutors, and equipment that are all needed to conduct criminal investigations. DEA aircraft are also used to pinpoint the exact location of clandestine laboratories, drug storage sites, and illegal airstrips. There are other components of the U.S. government who conduct joint operations with the government of Peru in an air interdiction program. This program is designed to identify and track suspect drug planes used in the transportation of cocaine hydrochloride and base from Peru to neighboring countries. DEA does not conduct operations in direct support of that initiative. DEA has supported that program by supplying law enforcement information on clandestine airstrips, suspect aircraft, and the movement of drugs and money by major criminal organizations. <clears throat> DEA's primary mission is not interdiction per se. Rather, it is the dismantling of drug trafficking organizations through the investigation, indictment, and imprisonment of the leaders of those criminal groups. Now, that process involves an approach that allows criminal investigations, law enforcement intelligence, and interdiction activities to complement each other and create a cycle that benefits the overall drug law enforcement efforts. DEA's primary goal in that process is not the interdiction of illegal drugs per se. Rather, it's to permanently remove those ruthless and predatory criminal organizations that produce and distribute those drugs. And we see that those criminals market their poison to weak and vulnerable people in our society. They degrade the quality of life in communities all across America. They contribute to crime and violence and death in this country. They destroy the future of many of our youth, and they rob many people even of their basic human dignity. And I believe that all of us have a grave and profound responsibility to protect the countless victims of drug criminals and at the same time to do everything humanly possible to prevent the loss of innocent lives as we so tragically saw in this April 20th incident. Mr. Chairman and committee members, again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have at the appropriate time. Hey, thank you. Mr. Winwood, do you have an opening statement? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Souter, Congressman Cummings, and members of the subcommittee, I thank you for the opportunity to testify on U.S. Customs Air Operations in South America. Uh, joining my colleagues, and before I begin my statement, I would also want to join with 
and expressing my deepest condolences and sympathies to the Bowers family for the tragedy they have endured. And I also want to extend my best wishes to Kevin Donaldson and his family for his full and speedy recovery. The mission of the Customs Air and Marine Interdiction Division is to protect the nation's borders and the American people from narcotic smuggling. Customs contributes its air and marine assets and personnel to joint operations throughout the source, transit, and arrival zones. As a key link in the front line of U.S. defense against drug traffickers, Customs Air and Marine Division plays a critical role in our nation's counter-drug strategy. A customs authority to conduct air enforcement missions outside the United States arises out of numerous laws and presidential directives. In addition to these provisions, the United States government has international agreements and arrangements that facilitate our mission overseas. In 1989, Customs began to support interdiction operations under the control of the U.S. Southern Command, or SOUTHCOM, with the deployment of air assets to Howard Air Force Base in Panama. In 1990, Customs was formally integrated into the Southern Command's planning structure by Memorandum of Understanding. Subsequent to that MOU, Customs aircraft and personnel were deployed to strategic locations throughout SOUTHCOM's area of responsibility. And under Presidential Decision Directive 14, issued in 1993, counter-drug strategy shifted focus towards the source zone. Customs responded by flying routine missions over Columbia and began deploying air assets at forward operating sites and locations throughout the region. Our P-3 AEW and slick aircraft with detention systems designed explicitly for drug interdiction have become the mainstay of source zone detection and monitoring. We also utilize C-550 jets for close tracking. As the efforts to expand interdiction beyond U.S. borders have increased, so has the need for customs presence in the source zone. Customs is now responsible for the vast majority of detection and monitoring flights conducted in the source zone. In the last fiscal year, approximately 90% of those missions were flown by customs assets. All customs air operations in the source zone are under the tactical command of SOUTHCOM as assigned through the Joint Interagency Task Force East. Customs detection and monitoring flights are conducted as coordinated assistance to host countries under the terms of special bilateral agreements. Thanks to this cooperative framework, Customs has traditionally enjoyed very good relations with our host country partners, enhancing the effectiveness of our mission. We have a long-standing policy that all Customs aviation miss missions must be conducted in accordance with strict standard operating procedures. Working with our host nation partners, Customs Air and Marine personnel have developed a series of detailed operating procedures specifically for South American missions. We are presently conducting a thorough review of those procedures. We go to great lengths with our host nation partners to ensure that all standard operating procedures are followed to the letter. The complexity of the assets we deploy, the advanced technologies we bring to bear, and the larger P-3 crews involved in these missions all demand an extremely high degree of coordination. We are also continuing our efforts to modernize our air program. From a mission perspective, modernization will supplement the safety measures and standard operating procedures already in place. Over the next year, we'll be taking delivery of six new P-3 aircraft. Mr. Chairman, the Customs Service is firmly committed to a strong and active presence in the source zone. The smuggling threat in this region is pervasive. The drug cartels who operate these are flush with resources and ready and able to exploit any situation to their advantage. We have a responsibility to ensure that the most rigorous of procedural standards are applied to this sensitive mission. But the smugglers should not mistake our thorough concern for the safe and effective operation of flights as a lack of resolve. From a customs standpoint, we will continue to do everything necessary to guarantee the safety and integrity of our mission in the region while curtailing the flow of drugs to America. I again want to thank the committee, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify and for your constant support for customs law enforcement activities. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Crow, do you have an opening statement? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members. Uh, Mr. Crow, could you see if your microphone is turned on or get Sorry. closer to you? Oh. Thank you. I would like to, uh, first of all, add one more voice to the many voices when I say that uh, our hearts very much go out to the family, to the Bowers family at this time, and our wishes uh, equally are extended to Mr. Donaldson as he undertakes what we hope will become a speedy and sure recovery. Re regardless of the outcome of the inquiry that's been initiated this week and will go on, 
And in view of Mr. Brown's very complete historical account of interdiction in Peru, I would simply add that we view air interdiction in Peru as having been the single most uh, contributing factor to the dramatic drop in cultivation of coca, the area of coca under cultivation in Peru that we've seen steadily since 1996, one year after the uh, institution of the Air Intercept Program. We also believe that air interdiction is essential to sustaining the success of Peru's counter-narcotics strategy, integrated <coughs> strategy, which combines uh, interdiction with eradication and alternative development. Thank you. Thank you, and your full statement will be inserted in the record. Emerald Belts, do you have a opening statement? A very brief one, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss counter-drug operations conducted and supported by Joint Interagency Task Force East. We join others here today in expressing our condolences to the Bowers family and our hope for a speedy recovery for Mr. Donaldson. With your permission, I would like my full statement to become a part of the record. And also, Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time, I will forfeit my remaining time and look forward to answering any questions. I thank you, and I, I want to thank you for uh, clearing your schedule to come up today. I know that um, uh, the JADF operations are based down in Florida, and there are many different things going on, and we appreciate the sacrifice. We felt it was important to uh, get on the record uh, this whole debating context because we certainly are going to have follow-up hearings as well. I'll start the uh, questioning, and I'm sure we'll go at at least two rounds. So I'm going to start first with um, Mr. Brown. Um, if we could put the uh, second one of your charts up that showed uh, how the traffic in Peru has changed. Um, uh, General McCaffrey has said that uh, if this air bridge is down, I believe, uh, I think he said 180 days, uh, if, they, if we have the policy changed, we'll see shifts. Could you explain a little bit uh, more of that chart, how it's moved to Riverine and what you think may happen short term? Well, what happened over this entire period of time, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to defer or at least would offer uh, Mr. Crow perhaps to amend this because for a good bit of this time he was at that time assigned to our embassy in Lima. But generally what you see is the trafficking uh, aircraft here appearing as northern bound red arrows actually were Colombian aircraft about 600 per year, so a dozen or 15 per week. I hope the math works there, but something of that volume at the outset and as the interdiction efforts began and this particular air connection with Colombia was a particularly vulnerable aspect of the drug cocaine production uh, system at that time. Those flights dramatically dropped in number. The prices that the uh, trafficking cartels in Colombia had to pay for those pilots escalated dramatically. I'll defer to Mr. Marshall perhaps for some numbers. And they, as you see, geographically went further and further to the east. Trafficking then uh, tried over the, if you can see there on the third chart perhaps, attempted to adjust over time and still is attempting to adjust by going to surface movements uh, to the west, to the Peruvian coast, and by movements uh, further south in Peru across Bolivia and Brazil and out through uh, uh, more indirect routes. So I, I hope, Mr. Chairman, I've generally responded, but if the number of flights dropped, the price went up, the risk was surely there, and I guess the bottom line point to, to where you're headed perhaps is the, the coca production enterprise, then essentially coca uh, campesinos cultivating coca, that essentially collapsed over the next three, uh, several years. Uh, there was widespread uh, dislocation, there was an aggressive engagement with our embassy, and other uh, Peruvian government uh, alternative development and assistance programs. So you see the price really was uh, quite low. And then I think the bottom line is the total cultivation capacity steadily, as Mr. Crow, I think, earlier mentioned, declined from that point till today. 
Uh, Mr. Crow, as someone who both at INL and on the ground in Peru, maybe you could elaborate on the last point that Mr. Brown just made, and that is, is that in uh, Pocalpa and Iquitos, as well as meeting with INL people on the ground and talking with people who have been in cultivation over the, I think I've been there now four or five times, what's clear is that I saw the pattern change of the willingness to join in the alternative crop program because when they had higher costs going through the riverine side, they in fact offered less payments to the most <coughs> poor. And when they offered the less payments to the most poor, all of a sudden alternative products seemed to make a, a difference. One of the questions, if you could elaborate on that point, and then also now that they've invested in the riverine, will they move back and how long will they wait to see what the United States government is going to do? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, the, the pressure put on by cutting off access to the air bridge, thereby making it more difficult and even impossible for the trafficker to get their end final refined product or cocaine base out of the country, led as part of a ripple effect to, to what we never would have imagined possible, that coca the price of the coca leaf at the farm gate dropped to below the break-even point, so that literally for the first time ever, coca was removed from the marketplace as the premier cash crop. And that set in motion for farmers who were predominantly non-criminal the, the opportunity to get to alternative development, which for years we had held and believed was the only way for a given country to get a leg up and to loosen uh, itself from the grip of, of trafficking. But at some point, even though alternative development is a lot more than simple crop substitution, we couldn't get there because coca always provided the best return. Never mind the, the farmer, in quotes, who's essentially a trafficker employee. The, the honest farmer would say, yeah, I'd like to help you, but you know, I can make more money with coca than I can with cacao. That changed. It had never before been something that, that, that was realizable, we feared. And uh, on the riverine question. The riverine, okay. Air will always be the preferred way to move drugs. But Peru has 8,000 kilometers, more or less, of river, riverway. And the riverine program is, is an important adjunct. But air will always be the preferred way. How much cheaper would you say it is to move by air than by the river network going through the Amazon basin and then do they have to go out to Venezuela or French Guiana? Well, it's certainly cheaper in, in terms of time expended and in terms of uh, eliminating a lot of the danger of being apprehended. It's, it's fast, it's cheap in that regard, and relatively uh, threat-free. Thank you. Mr. Cummings. Uh, just. Uh, Yes, Mr. Brown or Mr. Crow. What was our, uh, what was the situation in Peruvia, <coughs> I'm sorry, Peru, prior to the shoot down policy? You had a rapidly uh, growing coca cultivation uh, circumstance. Uh, the hectorage, I would have to refer to the maps, uh, but I, I think you see that. Uh, they were perhaps as much as 60% of the total Andean capacity for coca cultivation was then occurring in central Peru. Uh, you had an active Colombian presence in, in Peru. Most all of the production of cocaine base, essentially, uh, or going uh, back early in the 90s, was co coca paste, went on to Colombia for final processing and then marketing. And it was essentially managed by the Colombian cartels of that, that day. So if I'm on track with your question, Mr. Cummings, that's essentially what it was. It was a, a raw product uh, input function for an Andean uh, cocaine system managed by the Colombian criminal group. Mr. Grove? I uh, did my first tour, again, in the counter-narcotics <laughs> side in the 80s, in uh, 84 to 87 in Peru. And at that time, light aircraft were literally flying into the Huayaga daily with money, dropping off the money and picking up drugs. It was absolutely wide open. And uh, again, the dramatic change that occurred when the uh, pressure was put on to deny access to the, to the air bridge between Peru and Colombia resulted in a, in a night to day change. There's no question about it. And made possible for 
legitimate communities to sign up to alternatives, which in fact produced more revenue for them. Now, having said that, th this success, many people have viewed that and have written Peru off as a success. It is very fragile. It is very um, much an imminent success that needs to be nurtured. Because if any part of the equation falls off, terrorism comes back, the price goes up, the air bridge br breaks down, then you have the potential very clearly to go back to the way it was before. So right now, when you talk about it being fragile, <clears throat> right now with the suspension going on, um, you do you anticipate that we will have an increase in these flights, this direct flight situation that you talked about a little bit earlier? There is a clear potential for that, yes. Have you seen any indication of that already? I can't cite anything specific, but logic tells me that it's a, the potential is there. The, you know, the price has gone up, the price of coca. Now it is back up, not across the board, but it's gone up. It's probably much less than coincidental that Plan Colombia may have generated some of that, uh, but the, the inability to uh, control the skies as well as you might want to could add to the potential for the trend to continue and reverse itself. You know, gentlemen, when I listened to um, Congressman Weldon and when he laid out the various procedures that you have to go through before you can shoot down a plane, it seemed to me that if one were to do that, to do all those things, um, you would, it would, it would, the pr whoever was flying the plane would almost subject themselves to uh, being presumed guilty because there's so much, there's so many steps there. And I'm just wondering, um, do you all see this as a, uh, that is the, shooting down of aircraft as a necessary evil of this whole process? Well, I see uh, whether they need to be shot down or merely intercepted or made to land, I see the control factor as uh, an integral need, yes. Mm -hmm. be because otherwise, uh, again, the airway, the air part being preferred and being fast and easy, uh, you, ju you just couldn't keep up with them otherwise. I, I would add, if I may, that uh, the, the policy, this use of force policy uh, focused on here for Peru, but, but in many ways applicable to discussions of Colombia as well, those are sovereign initiatives by those countries. So what we're faced with in, uh, in this common goal that we have, I would suggest that it's an increasing one to, to do what we can, demand and supply side both in the hemisphere to address the problem, is to deal with the issue of will we assist with our information uh, or not and if we elect to do that then what would the conditions of that be and that's gotten us into the uh, the whole process of the mid 90s of uh, certifying that indeed drug trafficking presents a national security threat to both peru and colombia and secondly then assuring ourselves that that government's procedures that, that you referred to uh, we find to be uh, acceptable, and it's an interagency process, or was at that time in our government, to guard against the loss of innocent life. Mm -hmm. Clearly, we're here today because that didn't work on April the 20th. Just one other question, one more, if I might. Just, do you all, any of you all, think that there should be another step or two in those safeguards that uh, we talked about just now? May, I would suggest that uh, we could hardly have field, fielded a more qualified, capable investigation team than we just sent down Sunday. Uh, John's, uh, John Crow's boss, Assistant Secretary Beers, uh, people that work for Admiral Bell's, very experienced people, our U.S. interdiction coordinator, a skilled team. They will professionally and engage a like, like qualified Peruvian team, and I'm confident will make uh, in near term, an accurate report on just what went on during that incident and the failures with regard to the <clears throat> procedures or the implementation of those procedures that occurred. So I, 
I hope nothing I say pre prejudges that, but I'm confident that we've got a skilled, capable team in the field. Thank you. We've been joined by Chairman of the Full Government Reform Committee and ex-official chair, uh, not chairman, but member of this subcommittee, uh, Congressman Dan Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we appreciate your being here. I I'm a little troubled because I was, and I apologize for being late, but I just talked to some staff and they said that uh, most of the witnesses have said that uh, they're waiting for a report from the people who've gone down there to investigate this before they uh, make a, a, a statement on what, what actually happened. I understand from talking to Congressman Weldon that, uh, that uh, a lot of the procedures weren't followed, uh, warning shots weren't fired and so forth, but so far nobody on this panel really seems to be prepared to answer whether or not that's, that's the case. And I guess my question is, when, when Americans are killed like this and it's an, a tragedy, why does, it, why does it take so long? I know it's been 10 days, but this government can move pretty speedily when it wants to. Uh, when, did the, when did the people get down there who are doing the investigation, and why weren't they down there uh, the next day or two or three days afterwards so that uh, the Congress of the United States could be made aware and the American people could be made aware of what happened? Mr. Crow, you want to answer that? I think they wanted to be uh, very certain that the mix of people who went down was the correct one. And the they, mix of people that went yeah. down was the correct one? Yeah. Well, what, do you, what do you mean by the mix? Well, uh, uh, a broad enough uh, cross-section to uh, look at various aspects. Uh, I'm conjecturing to a degree because I was not involved in that. Uh, well, it, it seems to me as a person who's been here for almost 20 years that Within five minutes, you could say, I want to send somebody from the CIA, DEA, and State Department down there, and you'd cover the bases pretty well. And then you buy an airline ticket or send them down on a U.S. Air Force jet and get them down there to find out what in the heck happened. And here we are 10 days later, we're having a hearing, and the appearance to me is that, you know, uh, Mr. Souter moves as expeditiously as possible to have this hearing as, at the request of uh, other members as well. and. Uh, uh, it appears to me that maybe the agencies of our government want to kind of just let this thing go until it kind of uh, slides past and, and there's not any more hearings. But I can assure you, if we don't get some answers, we will have more hearings. Mr. Souter wants more. He wants more information. And uh, we don't like to send subpoenas out, but if we have to, you know, we can write pretty fast here and we'll do it. We want to know as quickly as possible why innocent civilians were shot down, missionaries down there and why it's taking so long for the various agencies of government to give a report to the Congress. I understand what you're saying, uh, Congressman Burton, and I can assure you that the team that went down wants to come up with these same answers. What happened, what went wrong, and how to avoid it in the future? And I think the time went to, to, to select not only the right mix, but the right people in that mix to, to do this job. And I'm confident that it's a very good team, it's a good mixture, and they are deadly serious about following through and coming up with the answers. Well, we won't, I won't belabor the questioning, Mr. Chairman, by taking any more time. I'll just say that uh, we, we on this committee, and especially the subcommittee chairman, will, uh, will uh, uh, want a complete report as quickly as possible. And if it's necessary, we'll have another hearing. I'm, I'm sure Mr. Sauter would be willing to do that. And uh, if necessary, we'll, we'll send subpoenas out to get whatever information that's not, uh, not uh, being given to us as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Satter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Schakowsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, gentlemen, I'd like to ask you if, in fact, that plane had been drug traffickers and had been shot down, would that mission not have been considered a great success? Anybody? Well, I think it refers to the purpose of the use of force policy uh, that we support by the government of Peru, and is that effective? And I think we've indicated that in our view, retrospectively, it certainly has been. It would have been successful, but the procedures, and I don't want to speak for the letter of the procedures, but I think generally the, the procedures that are operative have been discussed here are designed not to cause that to happen. They're designed to bring those sorts of flights uh, to, to but, but would there have been any inquiry into whether or not procedures were followed? Would anybody really care in missions like that? Is there any investigation after the fact 
Um, for example, what if everyone on board had been, been killed and it had been unclear exactly what, what had happened, because we do have eyewitnesses to that. Um, what kind of an investigation follows a shoot-down? Uh, I will defer to Admiral Bell to discuss after-action reports, but I would suggest to you here two things. Number one, I know and have been around uh, in the policy circles since uh, the beginning of this period of time. I know of no incident save the one, the tragedy of the 20th whether it's alleged that that sort of mistake has been made. In well, how do we know if there if there's not? I'd like to know, uh, maybe it is for Admiral Belt, uh, whether or not there is such an investigation that goes on and we try and find out exactly the circumstances and the procedures were followed. Uh, Madam, um, with regard to successful events, I would say that uh, each and every one of these events that takes place, we get information as to the type of event that it turned out to be. Was it a legitimate drug trafficker with drugs on board or not? That's all I'm at. So, so that's the, our only consideration is well, if, if in fact that, so the answer is yes, that had they been drug traffickers, then <clears throat> that would have been viewed as a successful mission. Barring some other uh, abrogation of any procedures that we would know, we can, we can, we can monitor that. We know what is set out and required by U.S. Uh, endorsement of those procedures, and we watch for compliance with those. We are involved at JADF East in detecting, monitoring, and tracking drug trafficking aircraft and vessels. Those vessels, once they are determined to be a suspect vessel, are then turned over to either U.S. or, in this case, partner nation law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, l let me uh, ask you this. If, if this kind of procedure is effective in reducing the use of drugs, why then don't we use it in the United States? Have private contractors who finger aircraft or vans that are owned by drug traffickers and, and then say it is all right if certain warnings are, are given to just uh, blow these out of the sky or, or blow up a, a van. Ma'am, I would suggest to you that in the United States, it, this sort of aerial, or aerial movement of drugs is not, not a threat. In the case of Peru, it is a national security threat. I would add Colombia to that. This sort of large-scale movement of, of contraband of drugs feeding the criminal groups, uh, the aberrations to the local economy that, that occur, it is assessed, and, and therefore they propose these use of force initiatives. That are, I are you before. suggesting that, that um, drugs are not flown in, in the United States I mean, well, to let, neighborhoods let, in Chicago let, let, or Baltimore or wherever? Uh, yes, that's that's what I'm suggesting. Uh, there is not uh, the aerial movement of drugs. I don't want to say there's absolutely not one flight, but essentially that sort of violation of our sovereign airspace does does not occur. We I, have we have a much broader law enforcement structure. We have communications with our uh, airfields, airstrips. We have a law enforcement presence that is not obtained in Peru or in, or in this southern area of. Colombia. But but uh, I mean I, th we've certainly all seen air busts and, and, and raids, but are you suggesting that if that's how it traveled, or even if vans, why don't, why don't we blow up vans in, in the United States? If, we're re if our goal here is to stop drug use in the United States, and we can finger those who are actually suspected of or in fact conducting that activity, why is it that we don't adopt a similar policy which to me, I mean, I, I would like to answer that question because that is not our law in the United States. It would, be cons it would be an outrage to the American public if without due process we were blowing planes out of the sky or blowing up vans of, uh, of people who were, who were carrying drugs. And I guess I'm just perplexed that we would contract out for this kind of service. And by the way, when I, I'm sorry the CIA isn't here because when I called to find out who are 
those private contractors, who is the contractor responsible for this? I was told, as a member of Congress, that I was not privy to that information, to even know who it was that's executing U.S. policy in, uh, in, in Peru. Thank you. I wanted to uh, clarify one uh, question, Admiral Belts. Uh, is there n not a checkoff that any of our pilots would show that whether the procedures have been followed? Yes, sir. There, there, are, there are published procedures for, uh, in particular, the detection, monitoring, and tracking aspect of the mission. And of course, I believe the people who are doing this are monitoring the compliance of those same procedures by the intercepting aircraft. Uh, different and distinct function as we move to the law enforcement part of that role. And certainly that was evidenced from what I've been able to also read in the media about uh, the compliance of that checklist uh, in this particular event. And it was not executed, and I think that's where you, you see the, uh, the indications uh, uh, of the crew attempting to intervene. Because certainly that would be something that the uh, Congress and general public would uh, expect to be an addition in a clarification to be able to analyze uh, is whether or not the uh, checkoffs that were in the legislation were in fact followed uh, by the host nation. That is correct, sir. <laughs> I, I would also add that the value of intelligence is very great. The more intelligence driven a given operation is, the greater chance for success. We would certainly pursue and have in the U.S. aircraft or vehicles that, that we believe uh, are worthy of being pursued. Whether we shoot them down or make them land or follow them as we have through the years is, is up to the individual situation. But intelligence is key. It keeps you from patrolling the skies until you run out of fuel. Carlson Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I want to make sure I understand everything clearly. That the CIA flight that provided the information was piloted by a private contractor. Is that what I'm understanding? I, I can't give you that answer with don't certainty. Know. I don't know. Do you know if that CIA, CIA flight that provided that information that led to the to the shoot down, if, if, were they under the control of the State Department or the American Embassy? Or I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the, your question. The CIA flight that provided the information that led to shooting down the missionary plane, mm -hmm. was that CIA flight under under the control of the State Department, the American Embassy, or who who controlled it? I can't give you that answer either. If it if it came out of the embassy, obviously, ultimately, the ambassador would have potentially known of it or, or been involved. But I don't have the particulars on that program. It's not a program that we run. Ma'am, let me try to give okay. you uh, perhaps a partial structural answer to it. We have a National Interdiction Command and Control Plan and architecture uh, administered by our Defense Department. And in this particular South America or hemispheric region, it really is operated by Admiral Bells and his joint interagency task force, JADF East. There then are, with customs aircraft or any other of our uh, aircraft, there are a number of intelligence or in-game assistance uh, sorts of efforts involving aircraft and other, other uh, uh, um, operatives, if you will. And those all work under the purview of, of our ambassador in whatever particular country and his country team there. As I understood it, I guess I'm getting confused on this now, the, there was a CIA flight that provided the information that led to shooting down the missionary plane. Who did that guy work for, that plane? He worked for the ambassador. Whoever that pilot, whoever that crew was, worked for the ambassador. Okay. Mr. Brown, he was saying he was under, I mean, Rear Admiral Belts, he was, Mr. Brown was saying he was under you. No. No. no I, didn't, I didn't say that, I, okay. or I didn't intend to say that. Pardon me if I did. I'm saying that the command and control structure for uh, air interdiction of aerial movement or maritime movement, better said, the detection and monitoring function for air and maritime movement in the whole hemisphere is a structure that's affected by Admiral Bells. Now, specific customs aircraft or other aircraft that are supporting our uh, cooperative 
supply reduction programs in any one of those countries fall under that particular country team and that specific ambassador. In this case, Ambassador uh, Hamilton in, in Lima. The general lady yield. Yes, be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Um, my understanding is that generally the flights, for example, the customs flights, would be reporting through SOUTHCOM, of which Admiral Belts is, is the coordinator of JADF. Um, and so the information is moving generally through you. But this particular case, when it is a CIA contractor, does not. Is that, that correct? That is correct, sir. Um, that uh, whether it's a customs plane or a CIA plane, they are nominally under the control of the ambassador. Is that correct, Mr. Correct. Brown? As a uh, practical matter, when it's a contractor, um, they have to follow the guidelines, but they are, generally speaking, more directly under control of the CIA on a day-to-day on -day basis other than in general mission under the ambassador. Is that correct? Yes, that sir. Fair to say, uh, Mr. Crow, is that a f fairly, in other words, each mission isn't necessarily micromanaged by the ambassador? That's correct. Although ultimately, everybody in the country working in and around an embassy answers to the ambassador. Including the DEA, because they're correct. all, uh, and those are supposed to be coordinated. That our concept of ONDCP is to have a general person watching the drug aspect because the ambassador has far more than just anti narcotics. Is that correct? Well, we have a, a whole uh, counter-narcotics country team at, at an embassy. And Certainly that's just a sub-part of the ambassador's <coughs> overall mission. Yes. Do you have a, any other? Th that may have, I hope, tried to clarify that a little bit. It's not, it's, uh, th that particular flight, my understanding, is nominally under the control of the ambassador. None of the other agencies had any input into it, and as a, on a day-to-day -day basis would have been indirectly under the control of the CIA, but they contracted it out. Does anybody disagree with that statement? Mr. Platts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And maybe a, first to follow up on that very point, understanding that the day-to-day -day oversight is not with the ambassador, it's with the CIA, but we're now 10, 11 days after the event, and is it accurate that at this point still the Department of State's position is that the ambassador, even though this flight was under his purview, uh, was a statement, you really don't have any specifics about this flight as uh, Congressman Woman, uh, Congresswoman uh, Davis I don't, is, I don't uh, think inquiring. there's any, any doubt that the ambassador would know that flight or any other supporting flight from customs or wherever it might be, or even the uh, logistics aircraft Mr. Marshall mentioned, were under his purview. There, there would be no question. I would suggest, uh, as evasive as it no doubt will sound, that the specific command and control rela uh, relationships and the procedures followed by our the aircraft involved in the April 20th uh, incident ought to await this investigation that's ongoing now. It will clarify and I'm sure will be made available uh, to the committee and to the Congress at large to give you a, a clearer feel for that particular relationship within Peru. And I, I appreciate that and, and, and my purpose here is to learn more about the program in total and, and as that more specific information becomes available um, to, to learn of that. Um, but it seems I guess to the chairman's point, Chairman Burton's point, that we are 11 days in and that we don't have some of the basics in hand to be shared uh, with this subcommittee and, and with the Congress through this subcommittee and understanding that uh, some of the specifics need to be further investigated, but some of the basic questions that have been addressed here have not been able to be answered. And that, uh, especially, I guess, for the Department of State, if, if the ambassador is the one ultimately who's got purview over this, uh, this flight, that we don't have some of those basic questions in hand, uh, you know, or answers in hand today. So the follow-up on that issue is what's, uh, and, and Mr. Crow, maybe uh, to you specifically, um, what's the best guesstimate you can give us on a time frame for this ongoing investigation to be concluded that you'll be back before us with some specifics? This could change, but I, I believe that Randy Beer's uh, uh, goal was to have this first phase, what may be a first phase or not, 
done this very week, uh, maybe three to five days, and I don't want to speak for him, but that is the idea. Whether there is any follow-up or not that needs to be done before it's all completed, the, the goal was this week to have the large, largest part of it underway and through. Well, that, that's encouraging to hear that time frame is what's being discussed, and I, I'm certain uh, Chairman Souter will be anxious to uh, to have that information made available to the committee as soon as it uh, is concluded, that first phase or perhaps first phase. Um, Mr. Brown, can, can you give uh, maybe a, a quick background on, uh, again, as one trying to educate myself, when we see the, the numbers which make a pretty strong case of the success of the interdiction efforts in Peru and Bolivia, 68 percent reduction, 82 percent reduction, but overall the Indian production is only down 17 percent, and that's, you look at the, the chart, you see where the increase is, uh, Colombia. What was your best suggestion what we're doing so right in Peru and Bolivia and not doing well enough in Colombia, or is it more internal with the interactions with the Colombian government where the difficulty lies? Well, I think one, one of the obvious uh, lessons here, I think, with regard to <clears throat> this massive cocaine production a criminal enterprise is that it will seek out uh, those areas not controlled uh, by sovereign governments. And in this Andean region, as, as perhaps many of you have experienced yourselves, this is a very uh, hinterland, uh, little infrastructure, no uh, law enforcement presence to speak of by the Colombians, for example, in this area of southern Colombia. So, so I think the answer is uh, that the criminal enterprises, which throughout this period were dominated by the Colombians, and, and in fact in many ways still are, sought out a more assured source of their coca product, of their cultivation, and it then began to expand, reacting to the threats uh, that were posed in part by the Air Bridge and other actions as well. And, and you see the expansion in, in Colombia. We're, heartened that the overall production capacity declined over that period, but uh, surely the, the criminal enterprises, the cartels, if you would, sought out places where they could basically dominate <coughs> the, the environment. Now, you have added complexity in the case of Colombia because there are significant uh, armed groups there, as perhaps you're familiar, that themselves then have exploited the growing cocaine production circumstance to their own ends. I might add, and I, and I did not uh, earlier to Mr. Cummings' question, there was in the mid-90s then a, a terrorist or a, a, uh, an illegal armed group, a Sendero movement in the earlier 90s that also was influential with regard to the security of these coca cultivation areas at that time. Now, that would be my response. The, um, it seems like from the chart that the, uh, the success we've enjoyed being specific by nation is, is how to have that be a comprehensive region-wide success and, and perhaps Plan Columbia will help us to achieve that because if you look at the tremendous reduction over 500 metric tons in Bolivia and in Peru, but you see an increase of uh, 250 metric tons in Colombia in that same time, we're, we're, as you say, the battle is just shifting as much as being uh, one in a, in a great fashion. So. Well, the, the cocaine production problem and the demand problem, which uh, is, is uh, a problem for these countries as well, is increasingly seen by all of the leaders to be a common hemispheric problem. The cocaine situation you, you refer to, and I think accurately, is indeed a regional problem and, and ought to be addressed regionally. And I think uh, you saw in our recent uh, submission here, the administration proposed an Andean regional uh, initiative that would continue these uh, uh, initiatives for the drug issue and for other issues in Colombia, but would expand that to the other uh, Andean countries to include Panama and Brazil, and that the nature of the assistance would be evenly, generally evenly divided between, if you'll allow interdiction, but it's basically a broader set of law enforcement and supply reduction assistance, as well as alternative development and related sorts of assistance in that area. M may I add something, sir, in response to your question? You, you asked what were we doing right in Colombia as well, and I think that uh, we're doing a lot right throughout the region, and particularly in Colombia. 
U.S. law enforcement along with Colombian law enforcement over the past seven to ten years have destroyed the Medellin cartel, the Cali cartel, and we've seen a, a, a mutation of the way these Colombian organizations operate. We've had great successes against their cells operating in the United States, again, in partnership with uh, Colombian law enforcement, who have been really nothing short of heroic. And what we see now is that uh, we really, I think, have had an impact on the growth of the cocaine market in the United States. It appears to me that that market has stabilized in the United States. It's no longer growing at the rate that it once did. And we see the Colombian organizations, what's left of them, uh, turning more and more of their attention toward increasing their markets in Europe and other parts of the world rather than focusing on increasing the U.S. markets. So uh, we have done a lot right both in the United States and Colombia and throughout the region, and I think we have to continue that. We're going to go to a second round. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And if I can just make a, a final statement is that I, I appreciate the efforts on the front lines and, and of uh, those men and women who are trying to uh, serve our nation through the interdiction. It's, I think it's just incumbent upon us because of the tragic loss of Ronnie and Charity Bowers, that we uh, renew our commitment to uh, doing it right from top to bottom. And I, I appreciate your efforts in trying to make that the case. And you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and moving the process along. Thank you. Thank you. And, and let me say first for the record that a 17 percent reduction on the uh, uh, interdiction is far more success than we've seen in prevention programs and treatment programs. The 17 percent reduction, while it isn't as great as what's happened in Bolivia, and Peru, uh, Bolivia has used a totally different method uh, through the UMA powers of pulling out the crop. There are, are different ways that different countries have done it. But uh, as we move Plan Colombia, my question, uh, if you can start me up, Mr. Marshall, is, is while we've seen success in the region, we saw some of the overwhelming success in Peru and Bolivia move over to Colombia. Now as we pursue aggressively Plan Colombia, we've, uh, maybe you can briefly comment again on the eradication effort on the coca and as we move to the heroin poppy, there is a danger that's going to move back into Peru, and Peru is again at risk. Certainly, you, you see that danger, and I think that, and I've heard in my travels and, and my talks with host country law enforcement agencies, particularly from Peru and Bolivia, that we must not think that their problem is solved and forget about them because they're concerned about the very issue that you raised. And again, that I think is an indicator of the importance of regional programs to address the, uh, the, the, the problem on a, on, a, on a widespread basis. And I also wanted to uh, elaborate on a uh, point that you said earlier, ask you to elaborate on. You said the primary goal of DEA is to get to the cartel level. Obviously, that is better done if the uh, drug dealers are alive. Uh, is it, would DEA not rather prefer if possible, to have a force down than a shoot down. Oh, absolutely. We we would rather have uh, a, a, an end game, as uh, as we call it, where we could have access to the aircraft, where we could ac have access to the evidence that we seized, uh, get in the database of the aircraft navigation system, um, interview the witnesses, the the people that were arrested, and and hopefully gain ever more intelligence information about who the cartels are, who their leaders are, how they operate, what their weaknesses are, and ultimately then, as I said in my statement, look to investigate, indict, and imprison, uh, bring to justice, as it were, the leaders of these organizations. It would be far preferable that behind each and every one of these incidents. Now, when I was in Iquitos, uh, they have air and riverine, but terrible highways. It takes forever if you tried to go overland. If there had been a force down, had this been a uh, drug plane, can DEA respond to that? Uh, can we move resources around or we, do we need additional resources if in fact we went more aggressive to that approach? We try to respond to as many uh, as, as we possibly can. But frankly, there are, uh, because of the, the problems that you outlined, it's not possible to respond to all of them. On those that we have been able to respond to and get to on the ground, we have gained some significant intelligence that, that, that led us to further criminal investigations out of uh, several of those, those uh, incidents. Do we cross-check information in this system before the process is implemented? Uh, 
was uh, DEA ask in any clearance mechanism when they checked the control tower whether you had any information on this plane? I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear your question. You in please? other words, how involved uh, is DEA? In other words, uh, while we hear that the final phases of this, according to public record, were a matter of seconds as they jump phases, clearly there was an extended period where they were following the plane. Supposedly this videotape is 45 minutes. Um, in that process, in the intelligence gathering, uh, is DEA contacted at any point, and did you have any information on this plane had they contacted you? We were not contacted in uh, this incident, uh, nor are we normally contacted in this interdiction operation. Uh, Mr. Um, Winwood, um, Customs clearly is also flying surveillance in the zone. Do you have uh, uh, source country people on the plane? I believe you have Peruvians as well in any of your uh, surveillance? Uh, we have, uh, we operate our dome P3s in the source country under the command and control of JADF East. Uh, on the aircraft, we have what we call a host nation a liaison officer on our P3 flights. And in most cases, we have a JADF East uh, coordinator uh, that's bilingual on our flights. So when we're operating in the source zone, um, we have uh, those individuals helping us monitor their air traffic and also to monitor the conversations that might occur. And uh, Admiral Bells, you have source country people at uh, your base as well? Yes, sir. We have, uh, at Jeddah East, we have both uh, uh, Peruvian uh, and Colombian uh, host nation or liaison officers. In the case of Colombia, both from the air side and the naval side. In the case of Peru, uh, an Air Force, uh, Peruvian Air Force liaison officer. Mr. Winwood, uh, could you describe the procedures you have on board before uh, you would get into the phase where there's a, a shoot down if customs provide the information? Well, as I mentioned earlier, Mr. Chairman, we have very stringent uh, standard operating procedures how we operate in the source, source zone. First of all, there's quarterly meetings as to what assets will be available, and then we coordinate with uh, JADF East and let them know what uh, assets we have available. They coordinate and set up the area of operations where they want our missions to be flown. Um, the detail that was laid out by the first panel as to the steps that need to be taken are a part of our standard operating procedures. We monitor those very stringently. When we detect a potential target um, and ascertain that it is a possible target, uh, we make sure that the host nation uh, liaison officer that's on the aircraft follows those procedures because once we detect and Would you determine, describe what make sure means? Pardon me? Would you describe what make we're sure We're monitoring means? the conversations. We listen to what's being said. We make sure that the checklist goes through. We make sure our crews follow the checklist of all the actions that we take. And the very first one that's done is to visually identify the tail number and then to, we have computers on board, our P3s, that we can ascertain whether or not it's an aircraft of uh, concern to us because we have not only access to the registered tail numbers of U.S. aircraft, but also information on tail numbers of foreign, foreign registered aircraft. And what so happens if they don't follow that procedure? Pardon me, sir? What happens if, you, as you're going, they're, you're monitoring them, they aren't following the procedure? Would you prohibit them from going ahead with a shoot-down? Well, I can't I can conjecture on what could happen. We've never had an incident uh, where there has not been the standard operating procedures followed to the letter, not one. And we don't plan on having any. We, we do constant training with our uh, host nation liaisons. We do constant training with the uh, officers and the people involved in the source country. Uh, we just had a, an updated training uh, the latter part of this past September. Uh, we've never had an incident where that would occur. If such a thing might occur, we immediately would report to our control, command and control through secure conversations to JADF East and notify immediately that there seemed to be a deviation from norm. But we've never had uh, such an incident. If, if I can ask, so what you're saying is while it's in process, if you saw it not being followed, in addition, you would contact JADF East uh, to warn them because they would also have Peruvians there. Well, Right. What we have, uh, what we have, Mr. Chairman, on our policy is that while we are involved in the detection and monitoring of an aircraft, there are three basic procedures to make sure air crew strictly follow. We monitor all activities associated with that particular engagement. We record everything that is occurring during that particular engagement, and we report everything that occurred as a follow-up. In addition to that, there's a debrief of all our crews uh, once the plane returns as to any incident uh, that we were engaged with. Uh, so that is constantly a part of our standard operating procedures. 
Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Do, can somebody tell me how many air, airplanes have been shot down since 1995? Shoot downs and force downs. We were not able to come up with one or agree on the same figure. The uh, figures which I, for example, uh, heard was given from post show. Uh, sorry. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we don't have one figure that we all agree on. We Excuse me, Mr. Crow, if you could just pull it towards you a little bit. Yeah. I think you turned it back off, too. Uh, sorry. No, I'm, I'm getting it. No, you're on. You were on. Sorry. Uh, we were just talking about it, that earlier. We don't have one figure that we agree on, but there are figures which show that starting in 1995, aircraft were not all shot down, some forced down, uh, but through a combination a figure of some 50, 50 aircraft, and that's not precise. All right. The um, <clears throat> Well, I mean, I why is that a... I mean, what, you, I mean you, I'm sure you have a great answer to this question. Why is that an issue? Why, why can't you tell me that? Uh, I mean, is that, in other words, <clears throat> we're talking about shooting down people. Yeah. Like dead or, and it, I mean, and we're talking about using, uh, I mean, this is some serious stuff. I and mean, I'm trying to figure out, I mean, if I was a regular citizen just sitting here, looking at this, and I've got uh, some of my top flight people in the drug war talking about they don't know how many uh, shoot downs or force downs, I, I'd be a little bit of concern about what's going on. Well, well, I understand, and I think that the, the time that's passed since the incident I, uh, maybe hasn't gotten to the point where we have one specific number, but I'm confident that the team that's down there now as a part of its work will be able to give the, the precise answer that is required. Mr. Cummings, if I may, I, I can give you some de figures on DEA's involvement, the ones that we were involved in. Since 1995, we have provided intelligence in 46 separate events, intelligence on suspect aircraft that we uh, believe are operating up there. Out of those 46 pieces of information that we provided, there have been 18 events that resulted in force down or shoot down. And out of those 18 events, uh, almost three metric tons of cocaine were uh, recovered. Okay. May I add uh, yes. as well, we provided a background chart. Yeah, I have, I have that here. And, but, but if I may, just to add to that, uh, I think what you see is different perspectives of something that is inherently Peruvian in its uh, development. Uh, that we have ongoing right now a, an incident by incident review of the database related to all of these incidents during all of these years. Uh, it is not available today, and in the appropriate setting and in the near term, it would be a made, made available to, to the committee members. But I think what you see is different uh, agencies within our government, not to mention what the Peruvians themselves would say about uh, incidents that they're familiar with that perhaps we only partly know or don't know about at all. So resolving that uh, quantitative understanding is underway now and should be made available to you soon. Do you know whether the, um, the task force, the group that's gone over to Peru to do the investigation, do you know whether they're looking into, and, and this is why I asked the question, I, I wanted to know how many shoot downs, I wanted to know how how many planes have been shot down. But you know whether they, they would be making a comparison to those situations where they were able to force a plane down as opposed to shooting it down? I, you understand the question? Yes, I would presume also that that information is available. In other words, the uh, number of aircraft that were actually shot down as opposed to made to land or forced down. And, and I'm, I'm talking about and what happened. Somebody said something about debriefing. Um, and I guess I'm just looking at what did it take 
for us to get, and I, and I know all the circumstances are different, but there may be some common threads running through those things. And I was just wondering if there's uh, a situation where they are looking into, well, in X amount of flights, we were able to force them down. And this is what we did. Language was not a barrier or whatever, you know, things that may have, that clearly show that there was a pattern with the force down. It may be a certain region, I don't know. Um, but I was just wondering, is that a part of it? Because it seems, I mean, I keep, I want to come back to what we are concerned about here, and that is uh, innocent people being hurt and innocent people being killed. And so here we have a situation where the pilot was at least able to get the plane down so that there were some survivors. Um, but the plane, the plane had been shot at, and two people killed. So I'm trying to figure out where, I mean, does this investigation entail that? And if it doesn't, I want to make sure it does. Rear Admiral, were you about to say something? I was going to refer to Mr. Crow to answer the specific question, but I, I certainly think that the trend has been, uh, certainly more recently, to have more force downs or ground activity than in the uh, shoot down category. Do you know why that is? I think um, I would uh, I, I would be premature to speculate. I've only been at the command for seven or eight months myself, but I think that several things happen that the drug traffickers know about this program, so they tend to go to the go to the deck when they're legitimate drug traffickers. And in general, there is also a process in place that is very, very uh, meticulous. The efforts that we've talked about heretofore are the, are the uh, procedures that take place after the interdiction. There is also a considerable amount of effort that goes on to identify a suspect or a potential suspect aircraft that precedes that. The Admiral's modesty is commendable. He also headed Jadif West, but it had a different uh, jurisdiction, but he has the unique distinction of having uh, headed both uh, divisions, which gives him a great perspective on this. Chairman Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had <clears throat> just a couple of questions. As I understand it right now, there's three agencies that are involved in intercepts, and that's Defense, Customs, and CIA. Is that correct? It's involved in the intercepts. Are there other agencies involved or just those three? Well, Coast Guard, Coast Guard in this could be, although not applicable uh, down in these areas. Uh, Coast Guard, though, that's that's broader, yes, sir. Th that's not in air in the air, is it? In, in transit. Coast Guard could be involved in, in yes, the transit zone. In the transit zone, yes, sir, indeed. The Coast Guard has planes that do that too, as well. Yes, sir, but not not applicable uh, to so, so to as to not confuse zone. the issue. Not applicable in the interior of these source countries. Okay, Chair Chairman, well, we, we, DEA is. I'm sorry. Go ahead. DEA is involved in intercept operations in the Bahamas, but we are not involved in uh, Peru or any other countries. Well, one of the problems that 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 that, that we have is that uh, CIA has been reluctant to give information or testimony before the committee. I think we're going to talk to them. Uh, when is it, uh, Mr. Chairman? Tomorrow, sometime, or in the next near future? Yeah, and. Uh, <clears throat> It seems to me that uh, there ought to be one agency, maybe two at the most, uh, that uh, are involved in the intercepts and enforcement of law that could report to Congress in the event that we have some kind of a problem in, in a fairly expeditious manner and we don't involve... I mean, I, I don't understand what's so secret about this that we can't get the information and get it very quickly. I mean, a plane was shot down, Americans were involved in the plane, were in the plane, we, we need to know, Americans need to know why it was shot down, what needs to be done to make sure it never happens again, and who was responsible. It, it, it's, it's not that difficult. Uh, and yet, it seems like we're kind of pulling teeth to get that. So I, I guess the question I have is, would it be possible for customs, let's say, for instance, to take over the intercept and enforcement of law in, uh, in uh, this, or would it be another agency that could do it and consolidate it all into one agency instead of having you know, four or five agencies doing it, one in particular that's involved in secret uh, covert operations that uh, they can't really publicly tell us what's going on. Uh, the, the structure, if I may, in part... Can you pull uh, the mic a little closer and turn it yes, up? Yes, sir, indeed. 
the interdiction command and control structure is is a Department of Defense led uh, effort for detection and monitoring of aerial and maritime movement of drugs towards the United States. So it's a defense. And that's department. expressed through if, uh, the Defense Department and through the, the GIADF that uh, Admiral Bells represents. In so, so, so the Defense Department has a primary responsibility then? For detection and monitoring, yes, sir. Well, could Customs handle that? Or, or, uh, I mean, is this thing. It, it, I mean, do we have several agencies that take de various parts of the overflights to make sure that uh, they're, they're monitoring uh, possible illegal transportation of drugs by air? The defense, the requirement to, to adequately manage this sort of uh, geographic far-flung command and control structure is almost uh, it's almost essential that that be the Defense Department. Okay, so that does do, you, that. do you parse out the, 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 the planes that are doing this and the agencies that are doing this? Do you, do you put that out into, into different agencies as far as areas yeah. of responsibility? Ad Admiral Bells can perhaps walk you through the, the, the tasking structure in which uh, they forecast requirements. The customs and other participants uh, commit their aircraft over time. Well, well customs, can you, can you tell us why is it we just can't have one agency? Doing this, so we have one agency that's, that's accountable, so we could get answers and get it in a quick, quick and efficient way. I have to borrow a mic, sure. Mr. Chairman. This one's not working. All right, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, I'll answer it this way. Right now, we supply the information to Jadif East, which is under the command of the Southern Command. The assets that we have available. That's to ensure that there's uniform standard coordination of all air activities in the source zone. So we meet quarterly, we lay out what assets we have available, what our flying hours are, what crew commitment we have, and we supply that information to Southern Command via JADF East. JADF East then, to have a central command, coordinates the missions and notifies us where they want those crews to be and when. And as long as the aircraft are operative and we have the crews available, we fly those missions. <clears throat> if you had enough assets, I presume you could do the job in its entirety, though, right? I think, if I may answer it this way, Mr. Chairman, any organization, yes, if we have sufficient assets, one organization could supply the necessary flight hours and equipment to allow for the coordination of the Southern Command to c cover the missions necessary to give the air coverage and the radar coverage uh, for this detecting and monitoring operation. Well, well I guess I, what I don't understand is why, why that isn't done. Why do you have uh, the CIA doing part of it, the Defense Department doing part of it, Customs doing part of it, and DEA? And I mean, it just looks like to me you've got too many different agencies involved in something that should be a relatively simple operation. You know you're going to monitor the flights of... Uh, of uh, planes that may be carrying illegal drugs. Why, why? I mean, see, I, you guys are all here willing to testify today. We've got another agency that says, oh, we can't. We have to do this thing in a private setting. And uh, it's very confusing, not only to Congress, but to the people out there who are paying attention to what's going on. Why, why is it this isn't uh, consolidated and streamlined like you would in a business to make sure that you're, you're running it efficiently and running it in a way that can be uh, accountable? Well, Mr. Chairman, I would just say this, that I think from the standpoint of command and control and working out of Southern Command through JEDF East, the coordination of the activity for at least our assets is coordinated under one command. Um, well, maybe I, to answer your question about the CIA, maybe, maybe, I can't maybe respond. You, maybe you should answer the question is, why is it there's several different agencies involved in this? Under the, I mean, one command is fine, but why do they have several different agencies that have different rules and regulations on whether or not they could... Uh, uh, give information to the Congress of the United States. Sir, I would um, suggest that um, the role of the Department of Defense in this mission is detection, monitoring, and tracking of both air and maritime assets. It's important to recognize that there's a broader uh, set of the AOR than, although, than, than this particular incident. There are also, as was already mentioned, other assets in each of our countries that are not normally working um, within the regional framework that is our focus, because they are, in essence, country assets. And as was already mentioned, those can be of a variety of agencies, including uh, uh, State Department assets uh, perhaps involved in eradication. They can be 
They can be, in fact, DEA assets, as Mr. Marshall indicated, doing some things. Or CIA. Uh, I'm so, sorry, or, or, DEA, sir. Or CIA. Or CIA, yes, sir. And generally speaking, the assets that we have under our purview are U.S. Customs, U.S. Coast Guard, and Department of Defense, both air and sea assets. And there are also radar in infrastructure. So that's the piece that we bring to this mission. And with regard to other assets, some of those are doing country-specific operations. If they're under one, I don't want to belabor this, Mr. Chairman, but if they're under one command and control, it seems like that command and control uh, organization, defense or whatever it is, ought to be able to get answers for the Congress in the, in the event of a tragedy like this and come up here a fairly short period of time and, and give us an update on what, why it happened and how it happened and why it shouldn't happen again. In, in this particular case, the chairman and other members of the committee uh, can't get those answers expeditiously. They have to kind of get it in pieces. Yes, sir, I, w I would agree, but uh, with, with regard to the specifics of the incident that we're speaking of today, I do think that what we know is what we know. We know what the procedures are and what they should have been. Well, who was in control at the, on, of this particular mission? It's Randy Beers. Who? Randy Beers is leading the team. No, no, who, who was in control of the operation where this plane was shot down? Who was in control of the plane that was down there that was... The it Peruvians was huh? controlled the Peruvians control the operation. It's their sovereign. Wasn't there a CIA or DIA, a, a, a plane that uh, was uh, monitoring those flights as well? I understand there was, yes. And but what, who, yeah. who, was in, who was in charge of that? Again, as we said earlier, that would have to be the embassy or the ambassador, ultimately, since that's an asset that would be... So it was the State Department? Sorry? It was the ambassador, you say? The ambassador, the, the chief of mission. So it was yes. a, a, the State Department the ambassador. The, he's a part of the State Department. That's correct. But uh, he's guess, in charge. I, of I guess I'm not making myself clear. If you have one, people. if the Defense Department is in charge of the overall operation that's taking place down there, if they're the one that's coordinating all this, why is it that we have difficulty finding out what happened if the CIA was the plane that was involved? ordered by the ambassador to be up there. Well, as Admiral Vells mentioned, they're regional assets and they're country assets. I understand, but somebody's in charge. Somebody's in, in, in control of that operation. But again, I submit that's precisely why this carefully picked high-level team went down to come up with these answers. I can conjecture I've been stationed there, but I can't possibly take the place of somebody who went down deliberately to be able to satisfy questions like this. I can assure you that they are taking it most seriously. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to, again, I reiterate for the record that um, we invited the CIA to testify today. We had earlier asked for a briefing, did not receive it. Uh, they were willing to do a briefing yesterday, but having gone through in the Government Reform Committee with uh, other uh, uh, classified uh, information that I was fear I feared at this point that, in fact, we would be told that things that were in the public record were, in fact, classified and we would not be able to ask questions or sort some of these things through. Uh, it was uh, better to do a classified hearing after this uh, hearing because of our past experience. Clearly, we want some answers. Clearly, this is very difficult because, as was uh, carefully stated, um, the, the uh, uh, CIA has other missions other than just what they were doing and how to untangle a trust from the American public that, in fact, we're being told the whole story regarding the drug mission without trying to deal with other things that are, in fact, classified is a very difficult process. But the American people want to know what the whole truth was so we can have confidence that if this is repeated, much like what we've heard today, that we haven't, and if I may just take a second before I yield to Ms. Schakowsky, my understanding is that even though Jadif East has, uh, in Colombia and Peru, coordination of assets that can be involved in the shoot-down policies, and Customs has assets in those areas, there has been no shoot-down that you've provided information, the goal has been forced down, but no shoot down where anybody has even made the allegation that uh, the procedures were not followed. 
Is that correct? Th that is correct, sir. This is, uh, but this is uh, historical over the history of the program. Uh, certainly, since the new procedures were put in place, that they have not been anything that has been alleged to have been that kind of mistake. And that's true for customs right. as well. Councilman Shikowsky. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me just ask, uh, gentlemen, if uh, you would be willing to respond to written questions, because I doubt that all of the questions that I am going to ask are going to be able to be answered now. Is it, is, does anybody object to that? Thank you. Um, I thank Chairman Burton for pointing out the kind of confusion that I'm and frustration that, that I am feeling right now as well at our just inability somehow to land on what was really going on in, uh, in Peru and what exactly U.S. involvement is. Am I correct in my understanding that there were no contract employees working for any of the agencies or direct personnel working for any of the agencies represented here that were involved in this incident in gathering intelligence or sharing it? Am I, am I correct? With regard to my agency, DEA, you're correct. There were no contract employees working for DEA that were involved in this incident. It's okay. Uh, that, that is Admiral correct for, for Jet of East as well, ma'am. Okay. So then, given the response to the chairman's question, then in fact it was the CIA, if I subtract correctly the agencies that are involved in this kind of surveillance, and it, it had to be the CIA. Because I can't even get that confirmed when I call the CIA, if they were the agency involved. Um, would anybody care to dispute that, that this was, that these were CIA contractors or CIA person, whatever? Okay. You look like, Mr. Winwood, you want to say something. I, okay. <laughs> I'm wondering if anybody wants a lifeline, make a phone call. Or I can something. only I, I can only confirm to you, uh, Congresswoman, that the U.S. Customs Service was not involved in this incident at all. Well, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Winwood. Does the, for, the, for the may I clarify one thing for the record? My understanding is is they can't give a direct answer to your question because it's classified. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I'm certainly not, Mr. Chairman, trying to to get. Your, um, well, it's fair okay. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, Mr. Winwood, does the does customs contract out at all? The only thing we contract for is in some cases is for maintenance of our aircraft when they're on the ground. We have no contract employees that pilot our aircraft, no enforcement officers in the customs service that are contract. They're all law enforcement officers employed by the customs service. Was there a, a, a reason for that? Did you make a, a particular decision? I'm trying to figure out why other why, why anyone contracts out? Was there a reason why you would not? Well, I can only go from the, the, from the standpoint of our philosophy in the Customs Service. We, we, we are a law enforcement agency. We feel that it's uh, that they have accountability and responsibility within your agency, that the people that work in this type of uh, uh, area should be law enforcement officers under the control and command of the, of the agency, and that's just our philosophy. So would you say that there is some sacrifice and accountability when we do contract out? No, ma'am, that's not what I'm saying. I simply said that, that we feel to have the proper accountability for the actions that we take as law enforcement officers, that we feel that they should be employees of the Customs Service, and that's what we tend to do. And, and the others? Do, uh, I, I would add that it's, uh, my personal view is it contract employees does not equal some suspicion of uh, lack of control or that it's inappropriate or just an ineffective way to do it. In fact, State Department's eradication <coughs> programs, and I defer to Mr. Crow to give you the details, but uh, those are in, uh, in large majority conducted by contracted pilots, contracted support. So I, I think that there, there are a number. If, if the issue is broader use of contractors by U.S. Uh, departments and agencies involved in the drug effort in, in South America, then there would be other areas where contractors would be involved. I understand. I I'm asking now specifically really about surveillance flights that could lead to shoot downs or force downs. And Admiral Bells, let, let me ask you this. Don't we have U.S. personnel who are capable of providing these services? What, why are we contracting? Why might we contract out? 
I can't answer that question specifically because it does not apply to our agency. And, and ma'am, uh, JEDEF East is made up of a composite of many organizations, certainly all of them represented at, at this table. And in some cases, I would concur with uh, Mr. Brown's table with regard to contractor use. I can say that uh, for our part, um, the um, generally speaking, the more operational the, e the event is, then the more the tendency is to see um, agency employees directly involved. Um, it was stated categorically that all of the, the shoot downs and force downs that, that we know about, that as far as we know, all procedures have been followed. Um, is there available to us either through subpoenas or just through um, unclassified information um, evidence that we have in fact asked that those procedures be followed? Mr. Winwood, it sounds as if you do that with, the, with customs and that we could track how in each case um, where there's surveillance done that procedures were followed. Do we know that? Or, or, or someone said there were just no allegations that procedures were not followed. Do we proactively assure ourselves that procedures were followed? And can we, as a committee, look at that and assure ourselves? With regard to uh, each mission, each mission is thoroughly briefed and thoroughly debriefed. With regard to uh, vessel assets at sea, certainly there are uh, significant efforts that go forward to get ready for these deployments, depending on the length of them. And there certainly is routine reporting at the end of that sometimes rather significant uh, in length mission. And certainly any uh, events that may come up for interest, uh, uh, good and bad, to, uh, we would get immediate feedback during the course of that. But each mission, each mission is uh, in fact debriefed. Thank you. M Mr. Chairman, I, I would just like to second what Mr. Weldon said, that I hope that we will continue these hearings and that we will use our subpoena power to get at the bottom of the many questions that remain unanswered. And I appreciate your willingness to answer some questions that I'm going to submit in writing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chairman Burton, did you have another question? I just have one, one or two real quick questions. Mm -hmm. um, now, the State Department plane wasn't the one that shot or were involved in this operation. Customs wasn't involved. DEA wasn't involved. Uh, and yet nobody can tell us CIA was involved because it's classified. Why is that? Why is it classified? A plane was shot down. Americans were killed. It was a plane. It was a civilian aircraft. Why is it that? Why is that classified? I don't understand that. This is not a national security issue. Why is that classified? Why is it you guys can't tell us that? Speak to me. <laughs> I think you'd have to ask the CIA if indeed it was their so operation, the why CIA, that's classified. If, so if the CIA says, okay, it was our plane that shot this, 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 this private plane down, and you guys are testifying from the other agencies, and CIA says this is classified, you guys can't say it wasn't us, it was the CIA, you, you can't even say that? I tell you. My, my understanding, sir, is that, that we cannot reveal uh, classified information from another agency, only that well, agency. Well, we're going to find out that. why CIA says this is classified. This is crazy. Mr. Chairman, will you yield for a second? It's crazy. Ma Ma will you yield for? Uh, Mr. Crow, can I ask you a, a different question that's been troubling a lot of us? Clearly, much of this has gotten into the media. Could you explain briefly to us in a crisis like this, uh, or at least a crisis of confidence? It's uh, history, but. American public now is having doubts combined with other things about all of our anti-drug efforts, which is totally unfair. Um, how does the declassification process work in a situation where the State <coughs> Department would say there's a general public interest in this, and how did the information get into the media if it's classified? I don't know how it got in, but, but certainly uh, what what happened in Peru became immediately known because of the interest of the evangelical organization, obvious interest and concern in the event, and that catapulted it into the, out into the open. And uh, I mean, it went from there. But, but again, uh, Randy Beers is down there to find out what happened, what went wrong, 
and what can be done to ensure that it won't happen again. I mean, if there is to be any kind of a positive end from a very tragic situation, that would be it. It's in all of our interest to come up with these answers. And I think we've made it clear, and I'm sure you'll take back, that uh, there's going to have to be a pretty compelling case why that report would be classified. Um, and, and it's in, in all of our interest in trying to, to work through both fairness and those of us who've worked so hard to support the different efforts. Uh, it's very difficult for us to carry the ball here when we, when we in fact have people asking difficult questions. Mostly uh, the majority of the questions today were coming from conservative Republicans who have been steadfast supporters of these efforts. I understand and I would want to clarify so that there's no doubt that these operations, whether they're in Colombia or Peru or other country, are under the control of the host nation. No American aircraft shoots down or forces down other aircraft. Yes. And that's important just to, right. to we, reiterate. We provided the information, but we did not pull the triggers and we would not allow our... There are many ways that information is provided, I suppose most of them classified, but again, intel-driven ops are, or maneuvers are the best way to avoid wasting your time. Well, we know that you've all been here several hours. We very much appreciate it. Uh, this was a difficult uh, hearing for you all to, to come to, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, some additional written questions may come, and I want to say also for the record, for the reason uh, this illustrates part of the reason in the command and control why we created the Office of National Drug Control Policy. It's also why that was moved up to cabinet level position, which hopefully it will stay if I can put in a commercial, uh, because in fact, we have so many different agencies working with this that, it, that somebody needs to be focused on a responsible effort to try to, to coordinate. Each of you have multiple missions in multiple places, and, and uh, there needs to be one agency that at least is providing direct oversight of the drug issue. So thank you again for coming. If you have any additional statements you want to put in the record, and we'll have some additional questions for you. Uh, uh, panel two is now dismissed, and if we can move to panel three. Just had my... Our third panel consists of private citizens who represent groups with an interest in this important issue. From the Center for International Policy, we have Adam Isaacson. From the National Business Aviation Association, we have Pete West. And from the National Defense Council Foundation, we have Andy Messing. I welcome all, all of you here if you can remain standing. I'll administer the oath. As an oversight committee, we, it is standard practice to ask our witnesses to testify under oath. If the witnesses will rise, raise your right hands. I'll administer the oath. Do you swear that the testimony you will give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Thank you for your patience. It's been a long afternoon. Uh, Thank you, Chairman Souter and members of the subcommittee. It is a pleasure to appear before you today to, test to, te to testify about this important issue. Thank you for inviting me. For five years, I've coordinated a program at the Center for International Policy that monitors the United States' relationship with the militaries of Latin America and the Caribbean, arms transfers, the training of over 13,000 military and police each year, exercises, exchanges, bases, deployments. I have to admit that among all these programs, the air bridge denial operation in Peru and Colombia was not getting much of our attention. It seemed less controversial. It was going after big time drug criminals, not the peasants growing coca just to survive. It carried little risk of sucking us into an armed conflict. There was little risk of massive human rights violations, or so we thought, because we'd been assured for years that strict rules of engagement were in place. So I was shocked and dismayed when I turned on the news a week ago Friday and saw what had happened to innocent civilians. I wish now that we had researched the po this policy more, explored the risks more closely, and tried to increase transparency over the way it was being carried out. We could have had a debate about this a long time ago. In the tragedy's aftermath, I must admit I've been disturbed by the United States government's rush to place all the blame on Peru. 
In the end, the details might reveal that U.S. personnel objected to the use of deadly force that day. But the United States nonetheless shares the blame. While a Peruvian pilot pulled the trigger, he pulled the trigger of a gun provided by the United States while flying a plane provided by the United States. He was trained in these operations by the United States, and he was alerted to his target by intelligence provided by the United States. I might add, just to cite the uh, New York Times, and at least to get some sort of answer to the questions in the last panel, um, congressional officials say they are examining the role played by CIA contract employees who worked for the Aviation Development Corporation of Montgomery, Alabama, just so it's in the record. That's last Saturday's Times. Peru was following a policy put in place by the United States as well. Over the years, Washington has handsomely rewarded Peru for pursuing its shoot-down policy with extreme zeal. Peru's regime and its military received aid, base upgrades, and perhaps just as important, political support from the United States. U.S. officials always mention, always mention the Peruvian success, not just at hearings like this one, but in public appearances with officials in Peru, repeating the number of planes shot down like it was a wartime body count. But accidental shootdowns are only one of the risks that this policy carries. What we're doing in the Andes are, deserves a lot more scrutiny than is getting. First, our single-minded focus on drugs can severely distort these countries' political development. Peru is a perfect example. The United States worked very closely with the Alberto Fujimori regime in Peru simply because it was a loyal partner in supply reduction efforts. The regime's cooperation earned it many open shows of U.S. support and quieted U.S. criticism of many abuses, which created a lot of political space for President Fujimori and his sinister intelligence chief, Vladimiro Montesinos. I bet that if they had not been shooting down planes so enthusiastically, Fujimori would have long become a Japanese citizen and Montesinos a fugitive a long time before. As the Washington Post reported two days ago, the agreement that established U.S. Co cooperation with the Peruvian government was negotiated directly with Vladimir Montesinos, the same Montesinos who cracked down on Peru's free press, who spied on Congress people, civic leaders, human rights activists, and opposition parties, and who helped fill jails with political prisoners while enriching himself enormously the same Montesinos who worked throughout the 1980s as a lawyer defending large narco traffickers, the same Montesinos who helped arrange arms transfers to Colombia's FARC guerrillas. Montesinos used the drug interdiction agreement as a political weapon, the Post reports. He occasionally threatened to suspend the partnership when it appeared the U.S. government was putting too much pressure on Fujimori's government. Even when Fujimori stole an election outright, Washington swallowed hard, quieted its criticism, and went ahead. The U.S. ambassador attended Fujimori's inauguration last July. We ignored what should be a basic rule of counter-drug strategy, that if, a, that if a partner nation is flouting the rule of law, then it is not going to be a reliable partner for long, no matter how many planes they shoot down or how many bases they allow us to use. A weak rule of law fosters corruption, a second policy risk. Again, we need look no, look no further than Peru, where last month we saw the arrest of General Nicolás Hermosa, who had headed the armed forces from 1992 to 98. General Hermosa is being charged with aiding and abetting drug traffickers, and he reportedly has $14.5 million in Swiss bank accounts. This reminds me of the celebrated case of General Gutierrez Rebollo, Mexico's drug czar, who it turns out was cooperating with our efforts against one drug cartel while helping another cartel. To what extent has the United States been unwittingly helping corrupt officials in other countries? Beyond corruption, warning signs about the reliability of Peru's military have long been evident for anyone willing to look. The Peruvian Armed Forces' respect for democratic rule has been questionable at best, and it has serious problems with corruption and human rights abuse. For years, Peru's generals have been above the law. Why then should we expect them to strictly follow aircraft interdiction procedures? Third, U.S. anti-drug activities in the region are being carried out in a way that avoids scrutiny and oversight, as we've seen. While some secrecy is needed to protect U.S. personnel and to keep from alerting traffickers to activities, we need more information in order to be able to gauge the policy's effectiveness, to be alerted to the risks involved, to guarantee an informed debate, and, let's face it, to prevent incidents like last Friday's shootdown from occurring ever again. Right now, we cannot say with confidence how much the United States is spending on its interdiction program in the Andes. We don't know how many military U.S. personnel and contractors are working in the region. We do know, though, that the U.S. military presence goes well beyond what most Americans would imagine. Um, that, but I have included a map in my written testimony indicating the many radar sites, forward operating locations, air facilities, training locations, and other U.S. presences. I'm sure it's incomplete, but it's remarkable how spread out our forces are, including some sites where illegal armed groups are quite active, with little public discussion or knowledge. And this is the U.S. involvement we know about. There are entire agencies, especially intelligence agencies, who, whose operations and budgets are obscured by an informational black hole. Another informational void surrounds what appears to be a large and rapidly growing role played by private contractors. Contractors were involved in the Peru incident. 
but this phenomenon has gotten more attention in Colombia. There, you've got at least six private U.S. corporations performing services that include flying drug crop fumigation aircraft, ferrying battalions into combat, serving as mechanics and logistics personnel, performing bottom-up reviews of the armed forces, and gathering aerial intelligence. Some of these are rather delicate missions. In Colombia, three spray plane pilots have died in crashes since 1997, and in February of this year, contractor personnel working for the Virginia company DynCorp found themselves in a firefight with FARC guerrillas while performing a search and rescue mission in Caquetá Department. Again, we know little more about the contractors. What companies are involved? What are the roles that they're playing? Are they taking on missions considered too dangerous for U.S. personnel? Are they getting too close to shooting wars in other countries? Are they bound by the same human rights standards that apply to military aid in the foreign aid budget? Are they consistently operating in line with U.S. policy goals? Who's making sure? These are very serious questions, but I can't come close to answering them today because contractor operations are taking place with almost no transparency. There is no annual report to Congress on contractor activities, and even some good investigative reporters have been able to uncover very little. This leads to a lack of effective oversight. Lack of effective oversight leads to bizarre policy choices and incomprehensible decisions. For instance, putting contractors who don't speak Spanish on surveillance planes in Peru. Beyond all of these risks, perhaps the most tragic thing about the current policy is that the ends don't even justify the means. We hear all the time about how air bridge denial has reduced coca cultivation in Peru and Bolivia, but the gross amount of coca grown in the Andes hasn't budged at all. Coca cultivation in Colombia has made up the difference, and co Colombia has lo lots of room to grow. I know the aggregate amount looks like it's decreased since 1995, but if you measure from 1990, the amount, the amount of hectares grown has hardly budged and it has gone down less since 1995 than demand for cocaine has gone down in the United States. The shoot-down policy has succeeded only in inconveniencing drug traffickers, annoying them a bit, forcing them to use routes other than air to get their product out. We haven't found anything approaching a defense against short-hop transshipment flights and the use of rivers and oceans to, to move drugs. Moving cult coca cultivation elsewhere and forcing traffickers to use other shipment methods are not policy successes. And they certainly don't justify a large military presence, a risky shoot-down policy, and close relations with corrupt and abusive governments. Let's hope that the April 20th incident signals the beginning of a change in our policy. There are many new directions we must urgently take. First. Nobody thinks that narco-traffickers have a right to fly illegal drugs around at will, but the shoot-down policy can be less aggressive without sacrificing much effectiveness. Since the policy already skirts the edges of international law and ignores due process, it makes sense to err on the side of caution. Mr. Isaacson, you're a couple minutes My time already. Is up. We start. Okay, thank so you. if you can just summarize, I know you're almost done. We'll put the whole thing. Second, let's put some limits on the use of contractors. Third, let's be more careful about who we're working with in the drug war. Fourth, let's focus much more on demand. Um, um, the need for treatment, drug treatment, has nowhere near been met in the United States. And finally, let's pay more attention to the reasons why poor people in the Andes are growing drug crops to begin with. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. West? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Schakowsky and Chairman Burton. Uh, thanks for asking me to testify and represent NBAA here. The National Business Aviation Association represents over 6,400 member companies nationwide and some around the country, but mainly in this country, operating uh, or involved with 8,700 general aviation aircraft that are used uh, for business transportation. Uh, NBA member companies earn annual revenues collectively in excess of $5 trillion, about half the gross domestic product, and employ more than 19 million people worldwide. The association's vision is to be the recognized effective force for enhancing safety, efficiency, and acceptance of business aviation. Our mission is to serve the needs of the NBA member companies and the broader business aviation community. <clears throat> Clearly, safety is the first and foremost element of our vision and the most important need of our members and the broader community. This is true for all of aviation, and aviation safety is my focus in the context of today's deliberations. As much as this committee is to be commended for holding this hearing, it is unfortunate that we are compelled to gather here today because of the terrible tragedy experienced by the Bauer family and Mr. Donaldson on Friday, April 21st. I'm here simply to reassert the most important argument MBAA and others familiar with the dynamics of civil aviation made in the past uh, and continue to make against the dangerous shoot-down approach to drug interdiction, the serious risk to innocent lives. 
Again, unfortunately, this argument was validated by the incident in Peru last month. And at this point, on behalf of everyone associated with MBAA and personally, as a husband with an eight-year-old son and a one-year-old baby daughter, I want Mr. Bowers and his son, Corey, as well as Mr. Donaldson, uh, to know that our hearts and thoughts are with them. The fact that this matter is under intense investigation should be, should be and, is, and is respected. It is comforting that the U.S. air interdiction efforts have reportedly been suspended in, in, much, in much, if not all, of the region and that related policies are being re-examined. Hopefully that re-examination will allow this situation to be addressed in the context of what is rational and relevant to available technology which I do not present myself as having any expertise in. Specifically, this panel is correct in exploring issues such as filing and verifying flight plans, especially in trafficking areas, suspect aircraft evaluation procedures, communications with suspect aircraft procedures and radio frequencies involved with that, and deadly force conditions. And it seems absolutely essential that there be a review of overall management and coordination of the program to ensure that there is thoughtful planning and strategy that incorporates appropriate and accountable safeguards domestically and internationally. We would also encourage further review of the important rationale supporting the position of ICAO with regard to this issue and the civil, and, uh, civil aviation. MBA commends those involved in the global fight against drugs for their commitment to this challenging and vital endeavor. However, this is a tragedy that could and should have been avoided. And it could have been experienced by any other innocent people finding themselves in harm's way because of a policy that allows those involved in drug interdiction, albeit blinded by the bright light of good intentions, to ignore the need for caution and patience. It is especially sad when considering the differences between the capabilities of the military aircraft used in interdiction efforts and some of the small civilian aircraft being monitored and quote unquote evaluated. There is at least the capability of commu to communicate by radio and failing that, the ability to send clear messages visually with certain standard procedures. A colleague of mine, the Honorable Jeff Shane, former State Department and Transportation Department official, now a partner with Hogan and Hartson, recently shared some relevant information with me in an email. He wrote, quote, sadly prescient language can be found throughout the statements issued in opposition to the 1994 change in the U.S. law that facilitated the restoration of U.S. cooperation with Peru and Colombia despite their newly adopted shoot-down policies. He provided the following. Senator Nancy Kassebaum, September 14, 1994, quote, to sanction the use of deadly force against civilian aircraft, as this legislation does, is beyond ill-conceived. In a deadly game of chance, this legislation lets the United States help foreign governments shoot down civilian planes based on little more than an educated guess, close quote. Senator Malcolm Wallop, September 12, 1994, quote, I believe that abandoning, abandoning our unconditional opposition to shooting down civil aircraft sends a very bad message, even if the rationale interdicting the flow of illicit drugs is a worthy one. By passing this law, we will encourage Colombia and Peru to become more aggressive in implementing their shoot-down policies. Accidents happen all too often without American engagement. Airline Pilots Association Randy, President Randy Babbitt and AFL-CIO President Lane Kirkland in a letter to Secretary of State Warren Christopher, July 15, 1994, quote, U.S. airlines operate in the vicinity of countries whose government's commitments to the rule of international law is suspect. We do not want such governments to be provided an opportunity to justify actions destructive to international civil aviation by citing a U.S. government policy that legitimizes violence against civilian aircraft. Mr. Do you, you're, you're over time by I'm about done. two minutes. Okay. okay. You can su summarize anything. I'll summarize by saying I won't give you any more quotes. I'll just give you one last quote. The president of MBAA, who said on June 30, 1994, 
quote, the potential for tragic error resulting in the loss of innocent lives is too great to warrant support for the shoot-down approach to drug interdiction. We're ready to help you all, uh, help all of us. Thank you. Major Messing. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I would first like to begin by thanking you and this esteemed committee for convening this hearing at an extremely important time. In recent years, support for the war on drugs has been dwindling and skepticism pervasive. Misinformation, fear, and confusion is increasing to the point that people are reaching for unrealistic solutions like stopping or limiting supply-side efforts or legalization without understanding the harsh ramifications. For the first time in history, drug-induced deaths outnumber homicide in this country starting in 1998. This is not the time to cease U.S. efforts. This most recent misfortune involving missionaries over Peru is a, a tragic accident, but cannot be allowed to stop, which has been an effective component of counter-drug policy for the United States. As a result of U.S. and indigenous aerial interdiction programs over both Peru and Colombia, the narco-trafficking air bridge has been significantly reduced. Breaking down this air bridge is just one part of this uh, comprehensive counter-drug strategy, counter-trafficking uh, strategy. The other components include restricting the land bridge, the river bridges, and the ocean bridge. These factors have been addressed by indigenous ground, air, Navy forces in the regions with select and now capped U.S. Uh, personnel, military personnel like U.S. Army Special Forces, Marines, U.S. Coast Guard, and U.S. Navy working alongside them. I have just returned from my 15th fact-finding mission to Colombia since 1985 and the 30th such trip into the Andean region concentrating on Peru. While on this trip, I met with uh, the director of Dante, the anti-narcotics police in Colombia. According to him, the narcos are now being given the green light to empty the storehouses and move the coca base by aircraft into Colombia. Given this, there's never been a greater urgency for continuation of U.S. aid to aerial interdiction programs. Since 1985, when the U.S. Congress approved the start of these programs, the Peruvian Air Force has positively identified and shot down 30 air airplanes engaged in drug smuggling. Additionally, additionally, over a dozen planes have been seized while on the ground thanks to U.S. help. Moreover, U.S. intelligence and counter-narcotics uh, trafficking has helped the Colombian forces. The Colombian Air Force uh, Chief Hector, uh, General Hector Velasquez states 20 of 48 suspected drug trafficking planes destroyed by Colombian Air Force in their territory and airspace during the past three years were flights first detected by U.S. authorities. U.S. efforts in Peru and Colombia alone have brought down nearly 100 aircraft shipping drugs that would have undoubtedly wound up on America's streets poisoning our children. It seems important to point out to the distinguished members of this committee that each ton of cocaine that is brought into the U.S. causes approximately $1 billion of direct and indirect costs associated with health care, losses in business, crime, and judicial systems costs, to name some of the problems. We're not even talking about the human costs, which are so very tragic. The U.S. must simultaneously help our neighbors to the south get a handle on the supply side part of the equation while uh, capitalizing on this reduced, su uh, reduced supply to gain traction on the demand side effort in this country. So long as our streets are inundated with massive quantities of low-priced, highly purified drugs, the war on drugs will undoubtedly be hopeless. We can never win the war on drugs, but we can reduce it to its lowest manageable level. Less product means less use, less use means less devastation, and therefore America's supply side efforts are important. Since 1995, the same year that this program was put into effect, cultivation of coca in both Peru and Bolivia has declined by approximately 70 percent. Some of this can be directly attributed to reducing the air bridge that we're discussing. In this most recent in incident in Peru, though, was simply a tragic accident. 
We will not know all the facts for some time, yet preliminary reports show that CIA contractors in the surveillance aircraft urged the Peruvians to slow down. Whatever the failure, the program of aerial interdiction has brought mainly praise from American agencies engaged in combating the drug trade and had tangible reductions in drug trafficking and cultivation. It is a failure in implementation, not policy per se. As such, it is necessary that a proper investigation be conducted regarding this uh, incident, finding out what went wrong, and surveillance flights must be continued as soon as possible, sans contractors. And lastly, I want to convey my condolences to the Bowers family and the family of the crew chief killed on a US C-130 aircraft that was also strafed by Peruvian Air Force a couple years ago. And I hope this doesn't reflect a sinister pattern by possi possibly malevolent elements in the Peruvian government bent on reversing the pre present modus operandi. Your investigation will hopefully dispel this lingering notion. Thank you. I want to thank each of you for, uh, again, for your patience today. I have a, a couple of things I want to do here. One, uh, given that we re-raised the uh, debate in 1994, I want to insert into the record the resolution from Mr. Schumer and Mr. Sensenbrenner, who is now chairman of the Judiciary Committee, that expressed the House representative sense of the House of Representatives should resume support of the operations for interdiction of illegal drug trafficking, whereas illegal drugs, it goes through a whole series of why, the whereas clause basically uh, says the Department of Defense and other departments and agencies of the United States should resume their former authorized practice of providing aid, information, material support to locate, interdict, and prevent the operation of illegal drugs. I want to insert that in the record. And then also the bill from Mr. Torricelli, Mr. Lantos, who heads our human rights efforts, and Mr. McCandless. And certainly, I don't want to imply by any of this that they support anything that happened here, because in fact, the bill is drafted to try to prohibit this from happening. But I think it's important for the record to have in what the members of Congress uh, at that time and the Democratic majority intended by uh, putting this policy in. I also had uh, a couple of, of questions from Mr. West. And this is difficult because, as you can tell, um, I certainly believe that there should be a lot uh, stricter standards. Um, and I have generally supported most of the pilots' uh, different associations' requests that have come to me. And obviously, there is uh, risk at, in uh, piloting in, in any case. Uh, and certainly, um, given that this is the only case we know for sure, that any uh, innocent pilot has been shot and that it's the only case we, uh, it appears that the procedures weren't followed and I think we all agree the procedures weren't followed. Um, and I think as more information comes out that'll even become more clear. But the fact is, is that both the, the um, uh, where we have the written testimony from the American, air, the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, one of the things I've supported from them is the Backcountry Landing Strip Access Act. Certainly that puts more pilots at risk in, the, uh, in, in some of these backcountry air, airstrips, yet that association is asking Congress to keep these open even though it puts more pilots at risk. Uh, and I insert that into the record from the home page of the American uh, Pilots Association. In the National Business Aviation Association, there's testimony on your home page from the president asking that the FAA uh, uh, not uh, on the emergency uh, certificate revocations that the person maintains the right to operate while the process is, is pending, which certainly puts people's lives at risk. In other words, there's a certain amount of risk you're going to have as a pilot. What we want to do is minimize that risk, but maintain that, that other people's lives should be put at, at risk uh, when, in fact, um, uh, there is a compared to most of what you do, almost zero risk of an innocent pilot getting killed. When you're backing other things in Congress that actually increase risk, I think is a little bit of an inconsistent position, and I'd like to give you a chance to respond. That's an interesting uh, approach you've taken. Uh, first of all, as you know, aviation has the best safety record of any form of transportation. <coughs> Business aviation is as safe or safer than the airlines, so we have the safest safety record. Um, I'm not specifically involved in the backcountry runways. Um, the other issue that you raised about um, our President Jack Alcott uh, on another risk-related matter, um, 
really, I, I don't see how, how, and please forgive me if I'm, but it's, it's sort of apples and oranges. We're talking about a military aircraft not following procedures. Maybe you say it was the one time, but they didn't. But it is the only time. But so what? So what? Well, they should follow procedures. That is. They should follow be. procedures. But the point is, but you're they saying were in if a position one where accident, they were. If there's one accident, things should be suspended. Why wouldn't that be the case in these other legislation? Well, the the risk is is always there. Uh, there was no effective radio communication. There was no procedures followed to go by and even look in. It was just. We agree on that. Something was in the air. Something was wrong. We something was amiss. Was Chairman Burton raised a question here that didn't get answered. So that could take us into a whole nother arena. But um, I really do, do think that it's, it's apples and oranges because... But you didn't, you didn't propose trying to make the policy more fail-safe. You opposed the policy. Is that correct? Excuse me? You weren't proposing to make the policy more fail-safe. You opposed the policy per se. Actually, I was proposing, in terms of the shoot-down policy, I was proposing that, first I was saying that we are comfortable that there is a re-examination of this thing. Yeah, which I agree with. And if you ask the Bowers and you ask uh, Mr. Donaldson uh, how they feel about that, I think they would appreciate it as well. Um, I, I don't think we should ignore what happened. And I do think the re-examination will allow us to look more clearly at how we translate to our foreign partners or foreign relationships. So you don't oppose the policy necessarily if we can address those questions? We opposed it in 1994 because there, there seemed to be an ignorance of the, the serious impact and risk that this put out for civil aviation operations, the type of, of possibilities that existed. I, I will relay to you uh, a conversation I have with former Senator Sam Nunn. I'm from Georgia and he was from Georgia and I used to head up legislative affairs for Delta Airlines. But I had joined business aviation and in 1994 we talked about the shoot down and he was a very vigorous uh, proponent for drug interdiction. But he focused me on this specific issue of the military aircraft versus the smaller civil aviation aircraft. And he emphasized the incredible risk that some member of Congress flying around in a general aviation aircraft, a dentist and his or her family, uh, missionaries like that experienced it in Peru. He said, this can happen. And we have to be very, very careful that we understand the differences between the capabilities of these two types of aircraft. He almost tongue-in-cheek said, you know, some of these aircraft are so advanced they could go to Europe and back before the, the private pilot could get from the Bahamas back to the country. They're so effective and they're very, very dangerous. And he said it's very dangerous territory. And I trust his, trusted his judgment then and I trust his observations now. And obviously he lost... But I, but I, go what? ahead and finish. Go ahead and finish. He, he obviously what? No, go ahead and finish your comments. I'm, I'm out of time. I, I, I appreciate... We appreciate the battle against drugs. And we appreciate what risk that drugs have to people's lives. I'm just saying a rational and responsible re-examination of this issue seems of the utmost importance because, yes, lives, lives were lost. And I don't look at things and just say, well, that's just one time. Yeah, I, I appreciate the gentleman's comments, but I want to point again for the record that uh, it passed. It was signed uh, clearly that that we in fact only know of, of one a case where innocent people were shot down. We know other congressmen have lost their lives in many, many ways, I'm, none of which I defend, but that there are risks whenever you institute a policy and your association and the other airline pilots association are asking Congress for, uh, to, to actually make some risk expanded and that it seems like an inconsistent position. However, a reevaluation is absolutely essential, and we're trying to address that question and put in as many safeguards as Can possible. Can I just say one thing? I, I appreciate your, our agreement, our aggressive agreement on, on reevaluation, reexamination. I'm just saying the apples and oranges are guns, shooting, I, I, fighting I, aircraft, now, versus th th that is risks a inherent in the growth of the society and okay. the culture and how we do things. Uh, 
it's, let it's me say for the record, things. you said twice it's apples and oranges. It is not apples and oranges. Risk in shorter landing strips where there are trees at runways and the runway may not be kept up as other runways are risk also that are just as fatal to pilots when there's an error. A, when the FCC says a pilot is unqualified to fly and you want to have a stay of whether that was a, a emergency qualification, the, the ruling on the pilot could be argued is a direct safety question. Now, I tend to support the airline owners, but don't come with us as a double standard. These are apples and apples. I agree that there is a difference. We we disagree on the on okay. the point here, but I think it's apples, apples. Uh, Congresswoman Schakowsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. West, I'm assuming that none of the six private companies that are conducting operations in the uh, Andean region are members of the uh, National Business Aviation Association? I actually checked, uh, first of all, the record of MBA member companies throughout our 53-year history are that there is no evidence of any member company ever being involved in drug trafficking. Uh, second, I looked into our membership. Not drug trafficking. You mean drug uh, surveillance or drug trafficking? Drug trafficking. Oh, you do mean yes. drug trafficking. Okay. Yes. What about surveillance? I, I am I am not aware that we only, we only have one member company in Peru, uh, and it is an a aviation services company. It is not a company that is involved with surveillance. Okay. Did you did you check any like DynCor any of the? Um, I, I would love to have a list okay. of those six companies and, okay. and check my membership Just, list. Because maybe you could provide us some information. I'd love to contact them if, if they are members. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to say that I, I have less confidence, although I'm certainly um, wanting to look at the record of the the shoot downs. I, I'm certain that there weren't any other American civilians that were shot down, but I think that it would bear looking at some of the records to make sure that there were no other civilians that were mistakenly shot down. I, I just feel somewhat less confident that that's um, the case without scrutinizing some of the, the, the records. Um, Mr. Um, Isaacson, um, you seem to question the assertion that the um, policies that we've been employing in interdiction are successful, um, that this 17 percent reduction in production um, has resulted somehow in helping us in the United States or that, and I, I just wonder if you, you would just expand a bit on the success of our missions in Central America, in South America. Sure. Um, if you look, at, as in the last panel, we saw a bar graph showing the aggregate amount of coca being grown decreasing since 1995. If you were to add the years since 1988, eight or nine, 89 or so, you would see that it went up during the first half of the 90s and has just gone back to early 90s levels. We've had no net reduction since the early 1990s. What reduction we have had is really due to the fact that less Americans are buying cocaine than were um, eight, nine, ten years ago. Um, the demand for crack especially has gone way down, and that explains that. What we've seen as a result of interdiction efforts, yes, it does certainly affect the way the drug trade gets carried out, but what we have instead is sort of a, a game of hopscotch where we've moved from Peru and Bolivia being the main producer countries to the Guaviare area in central Colombia being the epicenter of coca growing, and then to, to Putumayo, Colombia, after we started spraying in Guaviare. Um, where we're we going to go next, it's anybody's guess now that Plan Colombia has started, but chances are um, that there, there are um, about, there, there, there are any, uh, any number of places where the coca trade can move in the Amazon basin. Um, what, how do you account for the drop in uh, cocaine use, if not uh, this eradication program? Um, I am not really an expert on this. I'm more of a forward policy focus. But what I've been told from and what I've read is, is that a lot of it um, owes to um, the fact that, that, yes, the crack plague has ebbed. Um, there is no new, 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 new um, wave of, of, of crack addicts um, on the level of what we saw in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And it's, it's more a shift in, in user trends. Heroin has gone up somewhat um, while coca has gone down. and. Um, Yes, um, education and treatment have had some effect. Do, do we have evidence that um, the coca growing is just moving around? Um, certainly, all you need to do is even look at the last chart in, in that, that they showed in the last panel showing by the three major coca producing countries, whereas as recently as 1995, most coca was grown in Peru, now most is grown in Colombia. And looking within Colombia, you can see that it's moved within Colombia as well, yes.
Um, I, I wondered also <coughs> if you could elaborate. I've been focusing in, in legislation and on inquiries on the, the contractor issue. I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit about your concerns about that. Yes, my concerns mainly deal right now with accountability. I mean, there, I just don't know enough. There's no access to information. I can't even name those six companies in Colombia. I just got that that number from from an article in the Miami Herald. Um, you can't tell what what the companies are. You can't tell what missions they're carrying out. But that, of course, le leads the imagination to to wander a bit. What could these guys be doing? Um, how close are they getting to combat? I would not have dreamed before that February incident in Kakata that they would have been involved in firefights or carrying M16s as they were in Kakata. Um, are they involved with units that violate human rights regularly? Are they involved with paramilitaries? Um, there's any number of questions that we just cannot answer because we can't get even the most basic information about them right now. Thank you. Congressman Burton. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have two real quick questions. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I share your concern about uh, lack of information, especially after having listened to that last panel. <laughs> uh, let me start with you, uh, Major Messing. Uh, you say that uh, aerial introduction should start again as soon as possible. Obviously, I guess it's because uh, drugs are pouring in through the air during this hiatus. Is that the main reason? That's my impression. You have to keep concerted pressure on all four uh, avenues of approach, so to speak. And right now there's a void, and uh, obviously they'll pick up on that and uh, move product through. And I presume right now that the, the aerial surveillance has been curtailed around uh, Colombia and uh, Peru. That's my understanding. And uh, the indigenous uh, uh, forces in the region, the Peruvians and the Colombians, don't have the complete capability to to uh, bridge that gap, so to speak. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Isaacson, uh, did you mention uh, that out of Maxwell Air Force Base, there's a private contracting company operating that's uh, involved in the? Uh, Yes, I got that name from a few newspaper articles that have appeared since Saturday in major papers. So that's operating in Montgomery, Alabama. Aviation right? Development Corporation, yes, yeah, at Maxwell Air Force. That's a private Base. contractor. Do you, did, did that, I didn't see that article. Did it say that that was one of the, was that the contractor that was flying uh, that uh, surveillance plane down there when this plane was shot down? According to this and a few other articles, yes. And it was a private contractor hired, hired by the CIA? Yes, according to this, yes. And I've never heard of this company before myself. Okay, well, we'll check into that further tomorrow. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cummings, do you have any questions? First of all, I want to thank you, gentlemen, for being here. And, um, I mean, did you, did you all hear the, all the testimony of the previous panel? No. No? No, I didn't. You heard it? Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Messing? I, yes, not, I did. Okay. I got nope. here late. Okay. I was trying to but develop testimony. Yes, I heard it. I didn't I've been it. here since 1.30. Okay. Did you, um, was there anything that surprised you in any of that testimony? Um, I share Congressman uh, Chairman Burton's concerns about uh, a lack of centralized control. Mm -hmm. I think this is uh, a problem in the drug war. Uh, I share the Congress, the general congresswoman's uh, concerns with regard to con contractors. I'm a right of center organization. And my colleague who's left the center organization, you know, he articulated quite accurately and correctly some of the problems that we're having with this contractor phenomenon. I don't know if you're aware, congresswoman, but Senator Byrd put a limit on contractors on the Senate side of uh, 300. <laughs> I was one of the architects that put the cap on the military because I was uh, concerned about military industrial complex fueling this conflict. It's a 500 limit in Colombia for military and 300 for contractors. I think 300 for contractors is a little high. I've talked to the American ambassador, Ann Patterson, who's an incredibly competent and, and uh, skillful diplomat with regard to my concerns. Um, I think that it's something that has to be examined. I think that uh, 
anytime you don't, as a Vietnam veteran and as also a guy who is in Grenada and also in El Salvador as a reservist, I have to tell you that anytime you don't explain to the American people in detail what the heck you're doing, you're making a major mistake. Anytime you're trying to, to slip things under the carpet, like these contractors, you're making a major mistake. One of the comments was it's uh, cheaper. Uh, well, you don't cheap on something like this because this involves uh, a major impact on our society, on our social, political, economic, and security aspects of our society. Um, I've worked in uh, homeless shelters as a volunteer for a year and a half, twice a week. I've seen one-third of the people coming in there that have ruined their lives on drugs. I've held crack babies. I've gone on drug raids with the San Diego police, with the Fairfax County police, the PG police. I've gone on drug raids with the Columbia National Police. And I have to tell you that at every level, you have to have concerted pressure. And any time you take off a pressure point here or a pressure point there, the, the drug dealers exploit it to the max. This was a very unfortunate incident. It was unfortunate four ways. Innocent people, Americans, uh, a beautiful family, and Christian missionaries. It's, but, you know, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater with regard to policy. It has stopped as the testimony you heard in the previous two panels. It stopped all kinds of tons of cocaine from coming up. Now, one of the reasons we've had a diminishing uh, level of some cocaine use, as pointed out, is we've had increased methamphetamine production in our, our own United States. In addition, the Chinese are gearing up in a massive way to methamphetamine production. The Filipinos, who I'm in contact with, Philippine Intelligence Services, who, by the way, are one of the best, uh, one of the top ten intelligence services in the world, have indicated to me that methamphetamine production being coming out of China is going to come in waves like we just don't have any idea. And methamphetamines will become drugs of choice in, in, the, in the 2000s. Back in 1990, I predicted to the DEA that Mexican heroin and heroin would become the drug of choice in the 90s with a guy named Bruce Hazelwood. We wrote a report on it, which is at our website at www.ndcf.org. That report predicted heroin becoming the drug of choice in the latter part of the 90s, which it did. When I heard the DEA guy make his comments, I sort of rolled my eyes because they've always been consistently wrong about predicting trends. I don't know why that is. They get a lot of money. They should be able to predict it. But we're going to have a methamphetamine problem that's going to be out of this world here very shortly. But getting back to the subject at hand, I don't want to see us wind up throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I hope that this investigative committee winds up determining some of the problems that my colleague over here to my left, I might point out, uh, <laughs> uh, pointed out with regard to some of the permeations and corruptions that have occurred with people that we supposedly are cooperating with. We better, take, we better not be naive about this and think that everybody we work with is our friend. We better work with caution. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. I don't need anything. Carson, do you have anything else? I, I would just like to, to say, Major Messing, while I agreed with much, much of what you said, including the um, jugs of choice changing, I think in some ways that I, I would see that as proving my concern that if we're engaged in interdiction on cocaine, then does that really, is that really going to end um, drug substance abuse and drug addiction? That I think it underscores the need that we better deal with demand or we're just going to see the drug of choice keep changing and we're going to keep sending military personnel and over a billion dollars here and there around the world that we have got to seriously address the demand problem. Well, ma'am, demand is important, but it's like a juggler. You throw up two balls, one's demand and one's supply. And as a juggler, you've got to have the same equal and consistent effort 
on both of them. For instance, on the demand side, nobody's ever mentioned that the acreage that he's talking about, 900,000 acres of pristine jungle, the lungs of the world, and tens of millions of animals have been killed, and the headwaters of the Amazon River have been polluted because of the craven uh, requirements of people in our own country and other parts of the world that have been involved in ingesting this illicit and stupid drug. Uh, but the point is that uh, demand side issue cannot get traction if there's an abundance, an overabundance, if you will, of product. So anytime we can place pressure on uh, pushing down product, like I said in my testimony, less product means less use. Less use means less devastation. So that's why we have to consistently be pushing against the bad guys, so to speak. Uh, thank you very much. I want to reiterate your last point, too. You can see from the air the precursor chemicals coming in the feeding streams into the Amazon. Oh, and you can see uh, places where there are no birds at this point. Uh, we often don't hear that part of the debate. Also, uh, greenhouse, we... greenhouse effect, pollution. Uh, is phenomenal because it's a burn in place slash and burn policy by drug dealers. I also want to um, reiterate that what was a common story out of today is that none of us want to see any pilot, any missionaries, any congressman for that matter, uh, uh, shot down. Uh, and we want to make sure that if the policy is reinstituted that there are additional safeguards. We also don't want the people of Peru and Colombia to be shot down either. This isn't just a question of innocent people from America. It has to be uh, a, a worldwide phenomena. I also want to point out that synthetic drugs clearly are a phenomenon that Congress is, is seeing across the country. We're trying to deal with the methamphetamine, the ecstasy, and other uh, drugs. Uh, uh, hopefully, Congressman uh, Cummings, as well as myself, the next International Narcotics Conference in, is next spring in Japan, and the focus is going to be methamphetamines and the synthetic. Uh, Europe is facing it, U.S. Uh, and other countries as well. Uh, the uh, last thing I would like to do for the record is to insert a uh, AP story that ran yesterday. The, uh, a missionary says the United States should quickly resume drug surveillance flights suspended after his wife and adopted baby were killed in Peru when they were mistaken for drug smugglers and shot down. Jim Bowers, who survived unharmed when their small plane crash landed after being fired upon by a Peruvian warplane April 20th, said Monday he has expressed that view in a call to Secretary of State Colin Powell's office. To say there needs to be an entire review of the whole program and suspend it and to let the drug people continue their business as usual is wrong. He said clearly uh, they need to find out, but he believes it was an error. Obviously, uh, we're going to have an extended debate. And to reiterate, reiterate again, uh, regardless of where you stand on this issue, clearly the policy needs to be reviewed. We need to have this in public. We need to have the debate. Uh, in public, but it is not clear-cut what the end answer should be. With that, I thank the uh, witnesses today. I thank all of our uh, panelists. Look forward to our next hearing on the subject. And with that, the hearing stands adjourned. You might, you might revise the baby with the bathroom in light of the baby with the bathroom. I just wouldn't use that. Yeah. Good job. Hey, uh, you had some very good points about Montesino and, uh, and, uh, and Fujimori. This Friday on American Writers from Battle Creek, Michigan, a look at the life and work of Sojourner Truth. We'll consider her impact on abolitionism and the women's rights movement.